Gut. So, what are we talking about this morning for about 20 minutes or so is our curations project that we've been working on at Art UK um, that happened to sort of coincide with the events that led to the lockdown and closure of museums across the UK and how that's benefited or impacted and what we learned from that. But first I'd like to give a quick introduction to Art UK just in case you're unfamiliar. Uh, we're a cultural, independent cultural education charity based across the UK, and we seek to democratise access to the public art collections of the UK, enabling global audiences to explore them for enjoyment, education and research. As a partnership, we work with over 3,300 collections across the UK of all shapes, types and sizes. So museums such as the National Gallery, the Tate, the National Galleries of Scotland, the Sterling Smith, but down to sort of more venues that you may not expect, such as hospitals, zoos, cinemas, theatres. Thanks to our digitization work and working partnership, we have a collection of just over 264,000 artworks, which continues to grow. Um, and they are all hosted on a platform, a shared digital infrastructure that we run in conjunction with our partners and our advisory boards. The shared digital platform consists of the main Art UK website where you can explore the UK's art collections, learn about the art, art involved and engage in research and participatory projects such as our Art Detective Subject Specialist Network, which investigates and uncovers some of the stories behind the paintings in the UK's public collections. As I've said, we work across the UK with venues of all shapes and sizes, all the way from Cornwall right up to Shetland. It's a truly UK based approach. So, and as a UK based approach and a shared infrastructure, we've always, the organisations always had discussions about how we can share and bring to prominence the artworks of the UK, but particularly those in smaller collections that may not have access to the same level of infrastructure or technology as the big nationals do. And the first conversations were about collection highlights on the website to let partners tell the stories about their collections and also as a way to act as an archiving tool for physical exhibitions as curators had asked for it. The typical vision here was something along the lines of the Google um, Arts and Culture exhibitions and stories. Collections wanted something similar that they could use for Art UK. Also, we did have the idea of the concept of albums being built into version one of Art UK. The core functionality existed. So as a user, registered user, you can favorite, create sets of artworks and attach private notes to your artworks for research purposes. And when surveying, we just seen an interest from users in making these shareable with others or using them in slightly different ways. So for instance, teachers asking, is there any way I can share this with my class to facilitate a sort of lesson on a particular art topic? Or people researching a book saying, I want to share this with my publisher. And inevitably, everyone always commented on something like the Rijksmuseum does. When you talk about albums, participatory experiences, Rijks Studio is one of the products that always comes up again and again and again. I mean, use an offer similar to that would be of interest. But I was more, in, I and the team were also very interested in making sure that access was democratic and key to Art UK's mission. One of the trends we've seen with digital collections and engagement is the emergence of what Henry, Jen Henry Jenkins at Massachusetts Institute of Technology has talked about, the convergence culture, where people outside of curatorial or the academic sphere can appropriate artifacts and objects in digital surrogate form for their own derivative works and discussions and enabling visitors and participants to enhance each other's experiences as well as getting further satisfaction out of their own. Similar work in the area also includes the work of Nina Simon, in particular the Participatory Museum, in which she outlines a five-step model, the Me to We model, for integrating participatory activity and practice into museums in general. And for us, it's very much a something we aspire to, making sure that everyone can participate in this shared platform, this shared digital infrastructure. So these three ideas together, the idea of building exhibitions for collections, letting users share and do stuff with albums, but also getting them involved in publishing more information, we started to see an opportunity for a crossover here. And what initially began as three separate small projects 
himself converge together into what we now see today as the Curations Project. The Curations Project was officially kicked off in late 2018 and the development ran through 2019 and early 2020. It's an online toolkit that users and collections can access through the Art UK website and it allows any registered user, so no qualifications, no tests required, anyone anywhere can curate, arrange and publish their own sets, collections, exhibitions based on the database of works that we hold on the Art UK website. We offer very little editorial control. It's very hands off. Users can tell whatever story they like by adding commentaries, organizing, and then choosing from a selection of visualizations. And we see this applied in many different shapes or forms. So for example, it's um, we've seen Phil Jupitus in the first few weeks looking at collages, publishing, talking about them. Um, we have every, we have users using them as group exercises, animal alphabets, or um, collections of works for teaching, um, and then also exhibitions from our smaller museums and partners across the UK. So, for instance, the Ferns Art Gallery in Hull was looking at a display on British migrant artists. We've also had collections use it to do sort of highlights from their collections as well. So, being used in the same in a very in the way we'd identify. We aim to make the experience as straightforward and simple as possible. So a user can, when they're searching through Art UK with the press for button, if they're signed in, can then quickly add something to an, a curation that they want to put together, add, remove, and then they can go in and arrange, interpret. They can arrange, interpret, and eventually, once they're happy with it, publish it or unpublish it and then share it. We like to keep the exhibition interface clean and simple. As you can see on the right hand side there, it's just three, for every object, there's three fields you can do and they're all optional. So a user doesn't feel like they have to contribute something everywhere, just enough that they feel happy with. And then once they are put onto the Art UK website, the visualizations, um, the user can select the different visualizations that they can use. So whether that's a sort of narrative format, like a story or an article, which we would call a storyline, which is demonstrated on the left that takes the user through, images on the left, story on the right, or the or a, a showcase format, which is slightly closer to a sort of PowerPointy full screen exhibition experience, or even just a simple album, which is just an arrangement of the artworks on the page, one piece of interpretation at the top. So different types of visualizations for different ways we want to convey and allows for a different sort of breadth and depth of content to go through. The entire project took around about nine months from the initial specification design development through, through to launch. And what I'd like to talk about is some of the considerations that went into this and also some of the challenges that we faced. So when developing an interface like this, the first thing we had to consider is the value of a good user interface. And when building anything that is a purely digital platform, this is key. And when I'm talking about interface, it's not just the graphics and the icons and the shapes, it's the general sort of practice that we see how a user goes about doing something, how we can make it as easy as possible, which to be illust illustrated by this door handle on the right, which is a source of frustration for me, that overriding instruction, and it does catch me out every single time I go out the door in the morning. So the importance of a good interface is it has to be, we have to make sure that when we are developing something like curations that we're using, we're speaking the user's language in terms of terminology. So we're using concepts that they're familiar with, comfortable with, they can understand what they mean, they're not being offset by any jargon or anything that's like, oh, this seems a little bit too art historical or a little bit too sort of museum-y for me. We want everyone to take part in this. So the language is very simplified compared to what we may want to use. Also the notion of recognition and recall. So in that interface, the reason we keep it as simple as possible is that users don't need to check, oh, what does this field map to? What does that what do? The idea is they can go in, right? There's a title, there's a date, there's four, that's a year, okay. And there's a description, okay, I, I can do that. 
and we make it very free form so they can use it as they want. One of the considerations we were thinking about with additional objects or something is if we needed different fields for mediums or exhibition notes or provenance information, but testing it with general users, again, it's that words and the terminology and it's just, we'd have to look that up to check that. And if we have to document stuff extensively, we know the interface isn't working. So paring it down and simplifying it. What um, technologist Golden Krishna has referred to as the idea of the best interface being no interface or the smallest interface possible. An additional very important factor for us and for any museum organization when we're talking about digital platforms as well is accessibility. We are legally obliged to provide a certain level of accessibility now under legal protections, which is a very good thing. But even if that wasn't there, we want to make this as accessible to as broad a group of users as possible. So it has to work with screen readers, interpretive devices to help those who do not experience technology and visual displays in the same way that we do. To ensure success with this, testing early and testing often is absolutely vital. And to this, I'm very grateful to our partner collections, advisory boards, and the many, many critical friends who fed into this project throughout, always asking the very difficult questions and ensuring that we were making the best possible products. Admittedly, at times it could be a little bit frustrating, but ensuring that you have someone, when you're developing a project like this, someone who will ask you the difficult questions and will be will just keep nipping at you to do better is hugely, hugely important. And I'm very grateful to our partner collections for being able to do so. Our second consideration was images and copyright. Um, and it was clear that we needed to try and support some form of uploaded image for our exhibitions toolkit for museums. And this is to account for loans that may not be on the Art UK website or installation photography for exhibitions, or in some cases, even advertising material or stuff that deviates from the norm. So for example, one curation from Perth and Kinross Council is a exhibition of their Doogie Draws social media engagement project where a version of a painting was created in Microsoft Paint. So we need to be able to upload and put those images against each other. But as a digital publisher, we are liable for the intellectual property rights. We have to make sure that images that go on our platform are cleared. We have the consent of the artist or the estate or the rights holder. We make sure we've established all moral rights are in place. And trying to balance between how we are able to clear and manage that versus giving people a certain amount of freedom. So trying to balance that proved to be a real challenge. And there was many, much strong debate about this within our UK. In the end, we've decided to, uh, for the time being to restrict those uploads to collection users themselves as they will have a familiarity with what they need to do to order to check and clear images. And it's also at a scale where our the copyright team can provide extra support and advice for getting those images through and making sure we have work that's compliant. And of course, the unexpected. As a project manager, you are taught to be aware of unexpected things that may crop up. The coronavirus pandemic, national lockdown and everyone switching to remote working in the space for a week was not something I had prepared for, I will admit. And the, the other side of the other tension of this, of course, was a very sudden need to speed up our project. Now, we had talked about curations with partner collections before. The people had seen the value, they'd seen the needs. But suddenly, with every museum in the UK closed, museums were in desperate needs of switching over to online content. Again, something the bigger organisations can pitch to very successfully, very quickly with their platforms. Those who are with their social media certainly can get involved as well. But for those collections that don't have, didn't have the ability to publish their online exhibitions or share or tell their stories, there was a real sort of a sudden need for, we need to get this up here. We want to be able to share the information. I want to present this exhibition that has now been shuttered for who knows how long. And for this, our agile minimum viable product approach was key for the success here. And what I talk about here is rather than having one massive big release that comes out, what we've done is we've staged things out in several small releases building up to the final product. So we were able to sort of keep on track for delivery by delivering a very minimum set of functionality, getting that out there, and then over weeks, adding and building upon it. So extra functionality such as formatting or adjusting the presentation showcases slightly until we are getting towards what I what is considered a final product, but a final product in the sense it's good enough for 2020. 
The other advantage here is we could adapt to new and changing requirements, which also emerged as a result of the, um, the coronavirus lockdown. So in particular, additional functionality for exhibitions, being able to link back to information when these, when these places did open again, and also just looking at the visualizations and general user feedback as well. So we're able to focus on the functionality we know our partners and users really, really want. So we went away, we built this thing. Uh, we launched it in the middle of, in the midst of a lockdown. Um, and we started to see some fairly positive initial results from, from our digital engagement. And I'll run through some statistics of how we've done so far. So since the launch, which was on international, the official launch was International Museums Day. We soft launched the product a few weeks earlier to our partner collections and some users, but the official big sort of press launch was International Museums Day and we saw our traffic increase by about 20% that week. Since that's gone, we know that users have created 2,510 new curations since launch. But not only that, the existing album functionality was merged into curations as well. So the over 10,000 albums there have now become private curations that users can choose to publish if they like. And of this data set so far, 563 have been published by users. We have featured 78 of these. So an additional piece of functionality we've asked for is um, being able to select certain curations that are highlights or best examples or just stories we really like to tell. And these are promoted and shared at the very top of search results across the website. Um, and there's been some really interesting stuff brought in from users, users across the world, actually. In some cases, we've seen engagement in the United States of America, the UK, Europe, as well as this, we have just over 20 exhibitions created by our partner collections across the UK, including Fleming Collection, um, the City Art Centre, and um, several others. What we've seen typically is it's used to reflect a physical display that may not be open due to lockdown, and then it's been continued to be used as a digital sort of surrogate once that exhibition is reopened again. So for instance, with Flemings, they continue to promote the online exhibition of the Glasgow Boys at the same time that the shows, well, at least until, at least until last week, was open again to the public. And in those six months, we know about 54,800 people have viewed, experienced and interacted with a curation. But more excitingly for me, we know that people are spending on average between about 12 and 22 minutes looking at these curations and pages, which shows that they're really engaging, they're reading, they're taking, taking the information on board, they're enjoying being there and, con and consuming that content, which to me is very, very exciting. And also the strong referral traffic we've had from social media has shown that people have gone to their Facebooks and their Twitters and their LinkedIn's and their Instagrams and shared with their friends or collections are sharing with their audiences that these platforms are there. And that's been particularly exciting. That's so far. As of course, with any digital product that has a launch and you've got press and media involved, you see a spike and then over time this starts to go down. And at Art UK, we're starting to see this decline in views and engagement at this point with curations. It'll be interesting to see what happens with the next lockdown in England, whether that changes or not, but that un un unlocks the uh, presents the final challenge for us that keeping the momentum here is going to be key. And to achieve that, we need to make sure that curations are promoted, that we are engaging with our partners to onboard, to bring new exhibitions to the forefront, and also to continue refining that user experience to make it as easy as possible while unlocking new functionality and opportunities. And this has fed into a little bit of our future thinking. And the audience focused research is central to these future phases, surveying to assess the value and impact while maintaining that simplicity. And we've had a lot of feedback from collections and users so far. Um, I have one minute to go, so I'm gonna race through this. So ideas include collaborative editing. So not just one curation being done by one user, the idea of two or three people coming in and exchanging ideas and building them together. So they're shared under a group of users rather than a single user. Being able to share private curations with select groups for sort of appraisal peer review before publication. Media linking and embeds for exhibitions. So exhibitions, videos, commentaries, audio can also be shared and displayed. And then also crossing over with the rest of the Art UK offer. So for instance, this will come in very handy for our learning resources where we know 
teachers can be encouraged to go build curations for their students. All in all, I feel it's, it's an exciting project and it's shown what online exhibitions and online interpretation can do to drive engagement with our partner collections from learning, enjoyment, which as is central to Art UK's mission. I would thoroughly encourage you to have a go at artuk.org, build your own curation, publish and share it, and share with the world your story about the UK's national art collections. Thank you very much. Thank you, Terence. That was uh, terrific. What an absolutely incredible project. Uh, also coping with the timing of it and also what an impact it must have made to people because of that lockdown situation. And I, for one, use Art UK on virtually a daily basis. It is really the most amazing website. So I congratulate you and your team. Thank you. Um, so moving on to paper two of um, session one. Um, I'm delighted to introduce Abigail Webster, um, who is Programme Assistant at Edinburgh Art Festival, uh, um, which she combines with uh, curating self-organised projects at Embassy Gallery. Uh, she obtained her an undergraduate degree from Edinburgh College of Art and is due to complete an MA in Arts, Festival and Cultural Management at Queen Margaret University in December. Her um, current research seeks to explore the dialogic relationship between contemporary artists and curators through the lens of hospitality. Uh, Abby's talk for us today is called Performance in the Digital Realm, Potentials and Challenges for New Commissions. So over to you, Abby. Great, thank you, Alice. Um, so yeah, my name's Abigail and I'm Programme Assistant at Edinburgh Art Festival. Um, sadly, in April this year, the 2020 edition of the Art Festival was cancelled, though we did opt to produce a small programme online and around the city, combining small new commissions alongside archival presentations to mark the intended dates of the 2020 festival. In our online offering, we sought to respond to the needs and interests of artists and to try out new digital tools that reflected and supported their work. Today, I'm going to give an insight into the work of Calvin Z. Lang and Tamara MacArthur, each of whom were commissioned by Edinburgh Art Festival this year, and to talk about the potentials that they recognise for performance art in the digital realm. So, I'll just take a moment to share my screen. So, sorry about this. Um, so while presenting work online is no new feat for many artists and organisations, 2020 has certainly accelerated the trend towards virtual programming. As we'll no doubt hear more of today, many organisations have opted to digitise aspects of their programme that until now might have been digested in a physical environment be that the gallery or site-specific content um, context. Online platforms have proven to be a vital tool to engage audiences in a direct and immediate way, though this move presents specific challenges, many of which are practical, relating to resources, tools, and expertise. Additionally, it feels crucial to consider the distinct ontological question this transition can present, particularly when collective being in space is paramount to an artist's practice. For live performers in particular, the relationship with an audience is radically reconfigured, requiring a significant conceptual shift in relation to how they regard their media. While online programming certainly holds many creative potentials, for those of us commissioning contemporary performance artists, it feels crucial to consider how the support we lend can help uphold fidelity to an artist's wider body of work when transmission moves to the digital realm. So the first artist I'm highlighting is Calvin Z. Lang, who's an artist based in Edinburgh, who uses performance and moving image. In Calvin's practice, he acts as the protagonist, um, interrogating and exaggerating recollections of banal situations while making use of humour to highlight social anxieties. Often he performs to both an audience and the camera concurrently, 
working from a script that is semi-structured and improvisational as he constructs the social relations within a given setting. His approach to encounter and reception is nuanced, relying on happenstance and informality while feeding from an audience who in effect become a part of the work. The bodily co-presence of um, Calvin, the artist as an actor, and the spectators who come together in space is often central, something I was acutely aware of when supporting the development of his commission. While the resulting moving image element of each work beyond an ephemeral moment highlights the way that performance is often indivisible from its documentation. For Calvin and Jogging, the artist revisits his childhood neighbourhood of Drylaw, one of several suburbs built in Edinburgh in the post-war period. In the work we follow the artist as he revisits the suburban landscape of his youth, mixing musings on his personal experience of lockdown with memories of a time before the pandemic. Humorously unpicking the tropes of news reportage and documentary, Lang explores the emotional complexities of lockdown, as well as the chance to take up new pursuits. Though the performance was filmed in advance by Jen Martin, who in effect received her own private viewing, Calvin retained an unwavering commitment to the central place of liveness within performance discourse. To channel this, the artist opted to work, um, opted, excuse me, to channel this, the artist opted for the work to be broadcast at set times throughout August, rather than for the work to be embedded within a website for the duration of the month, with a specially produced trailer acting as a stand-in when the work was not available to view. I understood this choice to question the very definition of liveness and its implied temporal sequence, showing the concept to be mutable and historically contingent while questioning the common assumption that what is real is in the moment, while mediatised events are secondary or artificial. The work was broadcast on a platform called Twitch, typically used by video gamers to watch and chat with one another, though recently reappropriated by a number of artists. Performance art has, of course, a history of challenging traditional um, museum and gallery parameters, structures and practices, and as such, this choice must be understood as purposeful, while also bearing an interesting relationship to the way the Edinburgh Art Festival gen um, while also bearing an interesting relationship to the way the Edinburgh Art Festival generally situates work within site-specific contexts. So secondly, um, I'm going to talk to you about Tamara MacArthur, who is an artist based in Glasgow and produced a new online performance for Edinburgh Art Festival called It's All Over But The Dreaming. With a practice underpinned by drawing, Tamara produces installations, costumes and sculptures that are laboriously handmade and embellished and serve as sets or props within her performances. She often makes use of sentimental songs and stories and emotionally suggestive gestures such as crying and smiling while maintaining eye contact with a viewer, generating a fragile form of emotional intimacy and also a sense of discomfort. For the new commission, it was important for Tamara that the work existed as a kind of digital parallel to her pre-lockdown performances, where the audience is present, though the artist's attention becomes devoted to individuals in turn. Performing live from an elaborate theatrical set built in her studio, showing a house on a sandy island in the midst of a glittering storm, the artist held a handmade life-size doll, a reference to a doll owned by the painter Oscar Kokoschka, who had commissioned a doll maker to replicate his lost love. The work explores themes of loneliness, yearning and futility in relation to the enforced isolation we've all experienced this year. Um, and while also approaching our kind of um, our dependency on digital devices and the ubiquity of the screen in a very playful and experimental way. The performance lasted two hours and was presented via Zoom, chosen um, as the interface affords interaction between the artist and spectator. Audience members pre-registered on Eventbrite and entered into a Zoom meeting on Thursday the 30th of July, where they initially encountered a scene Sorry, excuse me, actually it's Friday the 31st of July. <laughs> Where they initially encountered a scene of imagined intimacy, observed anonymously. 
Spectators were then able to request a one-on-one -on -one performance from Tamara in a breakout room. An iPhone placed inside the doll's head enabled direct interaction with Tamara, with viewers metaphorically inhabiting the body of the doll. For the periods in between the doll, the body was left empty and unanimated. The artist waiting for viewers to dial in in a similar manner to an illicit hotline. The performance was recorded on Zoom, um, though a, photog a videographer also produced some documentation which we then opted to show on the Edinburgh Art Festival website between the 10th of August and the 30th. Um, so these works were actually achieved with very modest budgets and obviously under quite difficult circumstances. This hadn't been, um, these elements weren't planned for the programme um, as 2020 would have been, um, had we not been in this situation. So it really was a very short lead in time um, for the artists and for ourselves. Um, uh, the, the biggest thing I learned was you need a decent internet connection <laughs> to do anything. Um, and uh, that it is possible to very quickly upskill and learn how to do new things. Though um, we do think that for organisations to take um, this kind of digital mode of working forward in a meaningful way, it will necessitate investing in resources, um, both in relation to technology and the people using it. As a conclusion of sorts, um, I wanted to highlight how digital technologies can be a tool for experimentation, while playing a key role rather than a subsidiary one in relation to the concept, aesthetic and delivery of performance art. For both Calvin and Tamara, the conditions of, transmis of transmission, sorry, excuse me. For both Calvin and Tamara, the conditions of transmission were decisive choices, feeding into the concept of the work and the way a viewer might comprehend it. As such, I would caution against a standardized or one size fits all approach to commissioning new performance work online, as the strength of what was produced this August relied on the dynamic possibilities that artists recognize in particular digital tools. Taking this approach is of course a greater challenge as you really are required to be learning all the time, building and rebuilding infrastructure. Um, and sometimes obviously online things do go wrong. Though the digital programme might seem far removed from the way viewers typically interact with Edinburgh Art Festival, and it is yet to be seen whether this will continue as a dominant strand within future editions, and um, particularly when we might really yearn to be out in the real world again. Um, I really do believe that the visual arts sector must continue to keep looking to artists to find the most exciting things that can be achieved in the digital realm and the potentials for the digital in future. That's it. Thank you. Thank you, Abby. I think that is the most marvellous example of uh, creative people being creative in the face of um, quite extraordinary challenges. Um, and it's wonderful to see such um, an energetic and upbeat response by the Edinburgh Art Festival team, but also um, Tamara and, and Calvin. And um, I've got a few questions lined up for the, for the Q&A session um, in terms of, of performance art, but thank you very much indeed. Thank you. So, um, we're going to uh, move on to the third paper of session one um, uh, to be delivered by Margaret Sweetnam, who is a marketing and communications manager at Aberdeen Archives uh, Gallery and Museums. Um, she joined in 2016 in the new role of marketing and communications manager which was created as part of the Aberdeen City Council National Lottery Heritage Fund investment in the redevelopment of Aberdeen Art Gallery. Um, the Art Gallery reopened in November 2019, welcoming over 100,000 visitors in its first 100 days, uh, and then of course had to close um, in March uh, due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, during lockdown, uh, Margaret said that she found herself outside her comfort zone most days as the AAGM team rose to the challenge of sharing Aberdeen's outstanding collections to an online audience. Um, and she is immensely proud and rightly so 
the Aberdeen Art Gallery is a winner of the Art Fund Museum of the Year 2020. Uh, Margaret's paper is uh, called How to Be More Joe Wicks, Finding Our Digital Mojo. So if I can hand over to Margaret, please. Thank you so much, Alice. I'm just going to share my screen with you now. Okay, everyone see that okay? So, good morning everyone. The future is not some place we're going, but one we're creating. The paths are not to be found, but made, and activity of making them changes both the maker and the destination. This quote by political theorist John Shah really resonated with me when I heard it recently. Preparing this presentation has given me an opportunity for reflection on the, and the quote made me see that in terms of our digital engagement at least, it's been okay in these recent months to just take a deep breath and get on with it, even though at times it felt quite overwhelming bobbing about in our little boat in the midst of a tsunami of digital content. We started out with very little, but looking back we've achieved quite a lot and I'd like to share some of that with you today. So who are we and what are our digital engagement credentials? Aberdeen Archives, Gallery and Museums is part of Aberdeen City Council. We care for rich collections of art and history on behalf of the people of Aberdeen. In normal times, we share those collections with our visitors at the recently redeveloped art gallery Aberdeen Maritime Museum, the Tollbooth Museum and Aberdeen Treasure Hub, our purpose-built storage facility. Provis Skeen's house is currently under redevelopment and is due to open next year. A global pandemic was just one more major event for us, coming hot on the heels of the completion of the landmark £34.6 million redevelopment of Aberdeen Art Gallery. As Alice said, we opened on the 2nd of November 2019, so just over a year ago, and we welcomed over 100,000 visitors in under 100 days, and then along came COVID. Boom. We closed our doors on the 18th of March. But I do have to tell you, there is a happy ending of sorts that we were able to open again in August with many COVID measures in place. Some examples there. For reasons of capacity, time and frankly the enormous scale of the redevelopment project our relatively small museums and galleries team had prioritized opportunities for physical rather than remote digital access to our collections and activities this included wonderful new digital interactives throughout the building developed by our exhibition designers studio art for me the national lockdown brutally exposed our limitations in the area of digital engagement Digital had previously been the preserve of the marketing and communications team, two bodies, and was largely focused on promoting actual events in our buildings on social media, maintaining our extremely slow website and managing a schedule of blogs. Suddenly, everyone wanted to do everything online, and my colleague Julia and I found ourselves struggling with lack of time, skills, equipment, the total absence of a joined up digital strategy that the wider team could buy into and help deliver. As Lindsay and the learning team commented, it was time to be more Joe Wicks to find our digital mojo. From the beginning of lockdown, Joe showed up for us every day. He made us feel good about ourselves and the effort we were putting in together, reassuring us that it would all pay off. He listened to us, he made it easy to join in and he had squillions of followers, but my goodness, it was really hard work. A little further down the line, I can now find it in myself to be grateful for the sudden urgent need to focus on digital engagement. As a non-central belt art gallery and museum service with a large local geographic catchment area in this northeast corner of Scotland, digital engagement can really help us expand our reach, deepen engagement, promote sustainable solutions, reduce costs and perhaps even increase efficiencies. Tech can be an enabler of diversity, equality, access and inclusion 
And we also have to recognise that there's a digital divide in society. There are some staggering statistics out there about dig digital disengagement, poor broadband, lack of hardware, lack of basic digital skills. And as a regional local authority service, how do we make our voice heard amongst a torrent of digital activity? What did you do when you were closed? People kept asking. Faced with words like unprecedented, pandemic, self-isolating, social distancing, difficult shielding, and again, unprecedented, we agreed that the best tactic would be to provide levity, offer distraction, hope, point out things that artists have been inspired by, nature, the changing seasons, sharing uplifting stories in the midst of so much uncertainty and distress. We created a museum from homepage. We had very little to post on it in the early days, but we knew there was a hashtag doing the rounds and that we really needed to join in the conversation. We started by getting involved in, in things like the excellent Art UK online art exchange. Every week on a Thursday, we were encouraged to share artworks on a certain theme from collections other than our own. I'm not just saying this because Terry's here with us today, but Art UK really helped galvanise us all in the early days of lockdown. It felt so good to be connected with other museums and galleries around the country that we were united as a sector and our staff's many voices were being heard as they shared their chosen artworks with followers around the country, around the world. The doors to the actual collections may have closed, but this was a fun and engaging way of sharing treasures. Continuing. It's, if you're going to do it well, and as another of our presenters today, Alice Strang um, is going to show, um, you need to give it some time and thought. It can be a bit of a hamster wheel. I find, I find there were many times during lockdown where I really wished that I could give up all social media and then I remembered that it was part of my job. I found it increasingly helpful to buy myself social media free chunks of time by inviting others to take over our channels for short bursts. So we had writer and performer Shane Strachan sharing his collaborative exploration of poetry and fashion in the Bill Gibb line. His social media takeover featured items from our amazing Bill Gibb collection, filmed performances and original poetry by Shane. The result, new voices on our channels, reaching new followers and keeping our content fresh and interesting. Our own curators also provided some excellent content highlighting the breadth and depth of our collections. Curator and great British sewing bee superfan Morna Annandale ran up a beautiful little season to coincide with the grand final inspired by the competition's weekly themes. We clapped for our carers with items from the medical collection and used our blogs to reflect on socially distanced fashion and home as a place of liberty rather than isolation. In the early days, we chose to keep things light, sharing images of nature and the changing seasons. To our shame, we were initially silent around one of the defining moments of the period, the debate around, the debate around racial equality and Black Lives Matter. Social media has provided a platform to start a conversation with our followers. And during Black History Month in October, Head of Collections Helen Fothergill had been considering how best to deal with artworks in the collection with titles that use outdated and even racist language. In a short series of social media posts, she asked followers how the current titles made them feel and what they would do. Would they rename the artworks? Would they keep the old titles and ignore the offence caused? Who has the right to make these decisions? The responses have shown us that digital can be an invaluable tool for enabling us to be more equitable in what we do. So it's just a quick slide about engagement locations um, during the lockdown for our social media activity. As well as Art UK, another organisation that really helped us find our digital mojo was Smartify. As hundreds of museums, museum doors closed, Smartify made its manual virtual tour platform free for all UK museums and galleries until the end of 2020. In lockdown, our team of curators, learning officers and front of house staff set about recording their insights into 50 highlights from Aberdeen Art Gallery so that people could still explore these treasures safely from the comfort of their own homes. They did a brilliant job recording audio at their kitchen tables, under duvets, in cupboards, and even on the beach with seagulls in the background. 
we followed up with Discover Aberdeen Maritime Museum in, and we added in October, we added some staff picks from the BP Portrait Award. These are short spotlight talks where app users can look at a portrait and listen to one of our staff talking about their selection. Next on the lockdown to-do list, and it was a long one, um, our website was in dire need of a makeover. It was incredibly slow, not all that easy to navigate, and we needed to cull a lot of content that was well past its sell-by date. In October, we launched an attractive, clear, responsive new website. At its heart is a fantastic new collection search facility. This e-museum now has 50,000 entries. That's a lot more than the thousand or so items that you can see on display in the art gallery. And if you don't know where to begin, the collections homepage has a, a series of curated selections that group objects together based on a common theme or origin. Each page provides handy links to other similar objects, making it easy, for example, to compare royal portraits and analyze the symbolism on a coin. Hours and hours of digital distraction. As Terry also mentioned, the pandemic had a huge impact on our exhibitions program. We were no longer able to use uh, to show Haroon Mirza's immersive exhibition of sound and light installations, but Haroon and Listen Gallery translated some of these works for our website. We also worked with graduating architecture students at Robert Gordon University to co-present Drawn North, an exhibition reimagining waterfront areas in Aberdeen and Orkney. Aberdeen Artists Society took the bold decision to shift their open exhibition online from initial open call to submission, selection, presentation and promotion. One of the many, many great things about Aberdeen Art Gallery is that it has a concert venue at its heart and our intention had been pre-COVID that Cowdery Hall and the experience of live music would be an integral part of our programming. Then came COVID. Our energetic performance and events officer, Ruth Kent, set about organising a short series of pre-recorded online lunch break concerts hosted on Smartify. People for whom the weekly lunch break concert in the Cowdery Hall had been an important diary fixture could still tune in for a mindful moment of music. Most recently, and I have managed to hold off mentioning this until now, to celebrate our Museum of the Year 2020 win, we launched two playlists on Spotify to celebrate, one by multi-percussionist and Northeast Queen Dean Evelyn Glennie, inspired by Gavin Turk's Habitat, and one by artist Alison Watt, whose work Riviere is definitely a visitor favourite. We plan to release more playlists over the coming months. For our learning team, COVID-19 has had a devastating impact on their school's programme. They had welcomed hundreds of pupils to the art gallery between November and March, and then homeschooling arrived. Like our schools, they've, tuned to, they've turned to Google Classrooms, developed new resources to share online, and taken their CPD sessions online. There's so much more I could talk to you about today, and there's lots of new content in the pipeline, including online visual descriptions of artworks, mindful moments, talks, more music, and dementia-friendly sessions, and looking at how we repurpose our in-gallery interactives for online consumptions. The benefits have been, the benefits of increased digital engagement are that we've worked together as a team to deliver it. We're acquiring new skills, our digital presence is more varied and focused on sharing the collections. Our followers are growing and we're keeping in touch with them. As we learn to live with COVID, COVID and to return to Joe Wicks, we're feeling slightly less digitally flabby, a bit stronger in our core and convinced of the long-term benefits of digital engagement. We're ready and eager to continue our journey towards a coherent digital strategy that the whole team can buy into and deliver, one that's engaging, accessible, inclusive and relevant to our audiences. We want to learn from what others are doing. So it's fantastic to be here today and listen to all these amazing speakers. And we want to understand more about our online audiences and what they need instead of just posting what we think they need and be mindful of the digital divide. Aberdeen's outstanding collections deserve to be experienced by more than those who can physically access our buildings. Even more important as we all embrace the new normal. I want to leave you today with a few images by the most wonderful group of women who all live in Aberdeen and Aberdeenshire. They got in touch with us in the summer to say that Aberdeen Art Gallery's collection had been sustaining them through during lockdown. 
Inspired by the Getty Museum challenge to recreate artworks using household items, every week they chose an artwork each and shared them with each other on a Friday evening Zoom call. I would love to have been on those calls as the results are joyful, so insightful, clever, and really make you look at the original artworks with fresh eyes. They made us literally snort with laughter when we saw them. To feel these women's love for the collection was something really special at the, long of some lo at the end of some long, difficult months. It brought joy to us and to our followers. For me, this is the power of digital engagement. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Margaret. I love those recreations. And uh, I think that we should invite Joe Wicks to come along and do an Art, Curate, Art UK curation of Aberdeen's collection uh, to bring it all together. Um, so we are um, going to move to the uh, Q&A session, uh, the final part of session one. Um, so Cam, our Zoom director, is going to bring together um, Terence, Abigail, Margaret, uh, with me. Uh, so you will see the four of us. Um, do feel free to add questions into the Q&A function and to vote for ones that are already there that you would particularly like to be answered. So I am going to kick off uh, at the start um, an anonymous attendee, this one is for Terence, and the question is, have higher education institutions engaged with the Art UK curations tool and how is this going? Okay, um, fairly good question. Um, we have had some interest from higher education institutions and we have seen their attached museums in some cases producing exhibitions for the platform. So for example, I believe it's Royal Holloway uh, University of London who has done something on modern portraits of um, women students and founders, I think was the title of the exhibition. But it's one of the promoted ones up on Art UK. So if you have a look, you can come across it. We're always interested to do more with these with different groups. So we're quite good at working with the collection so far, independent curators, but working with higher education is an interest of ours and how it links into research um, in particular. This is gonna be very important for digital platforms going forward as we look at the funding that's in place for projects such as Towards the National Collection, where we're looking at bringing collections together for in-depth research and public engagement purposes. Um, I'll talk very quickly about where we are doing kind of a success story is kind of with um, schools. So we have been focusing mainly on that because our drive is to look at learning content towards what in England is the key stage two, three curriculum for excellence level three and four. Um, and we've, we're doing reasonably well with that working with with schools and teachers, but also independent charities such as Art History Link Up, which provides the A-level in art history voluntarily to students as a weekend course where it's been cut from their schools and local authorities. And we've seen some real successes in that where that's an online only course at the moment and how they're using that for teaching. Thank you, thank you. Um, I, I now have a question for uh, Abby. Oh. Has it disappeared? Here we go. Uh, this is from Tara. Um, going forward, do you think that these digital formats will become a preference for some artists rather than a necessity for future Edinburgh Art Festival events? Um, and what are the pros and cons of this digital format for art? Um, I mean, I think there are already artists that probably use that as their preference. Um, I think what we're more likely to see going forward is a kind of hybrid model um, where artists are displaying work online alongside work in the real world. I think particularly with the rise of platforms such as Instagram, you already see that and there being a kind of slippage between what is promotion and what is the work, um, as obviously Calvin who I spoke about plays with. Um, I think like I suppose the thing to remember is that even digital work relies on like production being able to happen in the real world which has been the really kind of challenging thing um, throughout this time um, but I suppose if I do relate it to a festival and 
as I know it was saying, not just in the context of it being a necessity for the festival. But I think when art festivals, um, such as Edinburgh Art Festival and that whole kind of August festivals offering are really these kind of um, dynamic transnational intercultural events when it doesn't seem like that will be a possibility um, in the real world to the same extent it has been previously for quite a long time. I think we are gonna see more of this kind of hybrid programming um, across the cultural sector to reach that broader audience. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree. That's great, thank you. Um, uh, we'll, I've got a question for Margaret here. I'm just gonna zip up the, the box to find it. Um, oh, sorry, just one second. Alice, I believe that Shona's put a reply in the in the text part of the Q and A section for that question. Okay, that's crossing. Thank you, Nicola. So I shall move on to one of my questions um, for uh, for Margaret. Um, um, you you all achieved so much, and I love the fact that everyone got involved. This idea of people being recording under their duvets and on the beach. Um, can you, you mentioned maybe um, what is the next thing, the one next thing that you'd like, like to do? Um, I think, um, and maybe I think somebody has also asked a question about this, I think it really is about finding out more about our online audiences and just using that to inform our next steps. Um, also during lockdown, we've done a bit of work on kind of developing a visitor research and evaluation framework. And, you know, as we begin to apply that, looking at our online audiences will be, you know, a, an important focus. Um, because as I was saying, you know, it's not enough, enough just to keep posting what we think people want to see. We need to, you know, be actively um, finding out what, what our followers and our audiences are looking for. And as Abby said as well, you know, for us, it's very much going to be about developing that hybrid programme. So, you know, as well as inviting some people into Aberdeen Art Gallery, you know, we can't, we can't offer performances. Um, so we are desperately looking for a tech partner who can help us kind of build those muscles even further and, um, you know, offer more of a kind of experiential online programme. Brilliant, thank you. Well, that um, brings session one to um, a close. I think that we are going to, um, yeah, we're going to have our break now. We are going to have two visual presentations during the break. The first one is by uh, Isabella Wagner, who is a student at the University of Glasgow in her final year studying history of art and English literature. She is a volunteer tour guide with the MUSE programme, that's Museum Student Educators at the Hunterian Art Gallery. And her visual presentation is called um, The Hunterian's Approach to Digital Engagement. And that is going to be followed by a visual presentation by Bianca Caligaro, who is um, co-founder, editor, and manager of Artgate blog. Uh, she's currently studying an MA in uh, History of Art with Film and Television at the University of Glasgow. Um, so um, we're going to share the poll results of um, the first poll, if that is possible, so uh, we can learn a little bit more about each other. And we're going to have our break and uh, resume um, with session two at 10 past 11. Thank you all very much.
welcome back. I hope you had a nice coffee break and thank you for taking part in our polls. I'm Shona Elliott, newsletter editor for the Scottish Society for Art History, and I will be chairing this session. Over the next hour, we'll be looking at the impact of lockdown on artists and collection staff, including how a furloughed curator responded to the crisis. Norman Macbeth will provide insights into his new photographic body of work, while Sandy Wood will explore the challenges faced by Royal Scottish Academy staff and artists earlier this year. Alice Strang's talk will highlight her Instagram posts and show how she adapted her curatorial skills to suit the new environment that we found ourselves in. There will be a chance to ask questions to all three presenters in a Q&A session at the end. Isabella and Bianca, who kindly provided the coffee break presentations about the Hunterian and the Artgate blog, will also be joining us at the end for questions. You can submit your queries in advance by using the Q&A function as you listen to the talks. So we're going to begin with a talk by Norman Macbeth. Norman is a photographer and printmaker living in Edinburgh. His work has been exhibited extensively in the UK and overseas. The National Portrait Galleries in London and, Ed and Edinburgh have over 70 of his portraits in their collections. Among his published works are collaborations with poets and writers, including Jeanette Winterson, Paul Muldoon, Kathleen Jamie and Robert Crawford. Simonides with Robert Crawford was shortlisted for the Ted Hughes Award and exhibited at Yale University. Collections which hold his work include the British Library, the National Library of Scotland, the British Council, Harvard University and Yale Centre for British Art. Over to you, Norman. Thank you very much, Shona, and uh, a very good morning to everyone. Now, let's just get this ready. A lot of my work has to do with what we see and why we see the, the, and why we see things the way we do. At the heart of that is my interest in the way in which context can play such a large part in perception. And by context, I mean the emotional context which we see something, how you feel, what mood you're in, and also the, the surroundings you're in at the time. Today, I'm going to talk about a new photographic body of work, which I was developing during lockdown, one that has been profoundly affected by those circumstances. A time when normal routine was shattered because of the need to avoid being infected by a new and potentially lethal virus, which, we, which was sweeping across the whole world and which nobody knew much about. The work is called Perdendozi. Perdendozi, a title which comes from a musical term used generally at the end of a movement and which means gradually dying away. I'd like to uh, begin by showing you two quotations. The first is by the Victorian art critic, writer and artist, John Ruskin. But the leaves of the herbage at our feet take all kinds of strange shapes. As if to invite us to examine them, they seem perpetually to tempt our watchfulness and take delight in outstripping our wonder. That's going to stop there. There we go. The second is by the Italian painter and printmaker Giorgio Sorry, Norman. Morandi. Norman, I'm just going to interrupt you for a second. I'm afraid we can't see your slides. Can you just try sharing them again? Okay. Thank you. How's that? Does that work? Nothing yet, I'm afraid. Is 
just tap share screen, I think that should probably do the trick. If we start. I'm getting those, but, but you're not. In Zoom, Norman, on the, the Zoom page, you should have a green share screen button at the bottom of the, the picture. Correct. And if you click that, you should have an option of which screen to choose to share. It should come up in a grid. And then when you choose the correct one, and which should be your PowerPoint slideshow, then you press share and that should share the screen to everyone. Yes. There you go. Wow, that's all we need, just a bit of help. <laughs> okay, how's that? That's spot on, thank you, Norman. Perfect. Great, okay. <laughs> the work is called Perdon Dozy, a title which comes from a musical term used generally at the end of a movement, and which means gradually dying away. I'd like to begin by showing you two quotations. The first is by the Victorian art critic, writer and artist, John Ruskin. There we go. The leaves of the herbage at our feet take all kinds of strange shapes. As if to invite us to examine them, they seem perpetually to tempt our watchfulness and take delight in outstripping our wonder. And the second is by the Italian painter and printmaker, Giorgio Morandi. One can travel the world and see nothing. To achieve understanding, it's necessary not to see many things, but to look hard at what you do see. So following on from uh, Morandi's view, I've been looking hard at leaves. When we think of leaves, we might think of the fresh green unfurling in spring, or the crimson and gold autumn, which is all around us at the moment. But it's leaves which show the least trace of that transformational cycle that interests me most. When, they're lo when they've lost all color and become more like parchment than plant. This is a time when leaves are at a held, drawn out stage in their metamorphosis, poised on the cusp of decay and their eventual disintegration. During this time, they can adopt extraordinary shapes as they slowly dry out. Some look as if they are peacefully at rest, some tightly curled and protective, and others enacting the moves of modern dance or classical ballet. I feel quite strongly that these these forms held with such delicacy and grace gave the leaves unique identities and character. And I think that's really what's at the heart of Perdon Dozy, the hidden identity and beauty of leaves. The curve and stretch of the lines in this leaf, for example, made me think of skilled balletic, balletic leap, like the finale of a grand performance. I love the paradox of stillness and yet apparently flying through the air towards the catch of an equally skilled dancer. This leaf was somehow for me full of individuality and exuberance. The calmer and more forward poise of this leaf with its quiet flamboyance, I found enchanting and endearing. I wondered if it could be listening to me. And here, another performance but this time with the elegance of the stem leading to a shape like a tiny mask through which the darkness looks back at us as if in a, a nighttime Venetian carnival. And what of this one with its curled tongue and desiccated dreadlocks, perhaps from another world? So many times I found myself simply delighted in the sheer uniqueness and originality of their form. So I remember, as Ruskin would say, tempting my watchfulness right from the start. These are just my reactions to the leaves, and I, I really don't want to tell you what to, what to see. So I, I thought I'd show you uh, one or two more leaves uh, in, in silence, just to give your imagination a little more space.
I mentioned earlier that many of the photographs were taken during lockdown and that that situation had had a profound effect on the work. This is a time when the daily news of the relentlessly increasing deaths and infections across the world left me shocked and frightened. Also a time when there were significant restrictions on when we could leave our homes. There were so many more unknowns then. Something that happened to me during this psychological upheaval was the development of a heightened awareness and increased sensitivity towards my surroundings, particularly the natural world. I could feel context kicking in. Quite quickly, I felt these familiar uh, subjects of study become freighted with new associations and symbolism. The damage displayed by these leaves on the edge of crumbling into the ground and vanishing for good resonated for me given these times. I developed a particular fascination with damaged leaves, particularly, I suppose, because of the damage I was hearing on every news broadcast, but also because of the beauty I found in them that was revealed as they gradually broke down. I'd like to say a couple of things on, on how I went about this work and the importance of, uh, of digital technology. I'd collect the leaves from wherever I could, all sorts of places. Initially, they came from a garden that I was walking in every morning on in, uh, during lockdown when I was making the most of our beautiful uh, uh, springtime. But as my eye became more attuned to the beauty and delicacy of these leaves, I found real gems in the gutter or behind plant pots or, or just anywhere really. And one even presented itself by landing on, on my doorstep. Once home, I placed them in cardboard boxes to dry out and reach their final form. When completely dry, the leaves were ever so fragile and delicate, each with their own sound. So they had to be handled with great care while I laid them out ready to be photographed. This was an extremely important stage and it's when I first really got to see and appreciate the individual character. I thought you might also like to see one of the final stages of, of this piece of work. Careful storage of the leaves with each of them uh, the, uh, details of when they've been photographed. Just before I end, I'd like to say something about the significant impact of digital technology on this work. Without the use of my studio in Petra Hall in Edinburgh, and with the restriction of going outside, I had to be as self-sufficient as possible to continue working. With a digital camera and computer, I was able to take all the photographs, do the editing, and take the process right through to the final exhibition print stage within the space of two rooms. These two devices allowed me to, to bring a particular quality to the work which I, I was after. I thought it was very interesting that there was this harmony between digital technology and the increased awareness of the natural world, the real world. I really liked the way digital technology helped me convey through photographs what I'd seen and felt about these leaves. I'm finishing with one of my, my favorite photographs from Perdendozi. In this presentation, I've wanted to share how the experience of lockdown affected my work. How for me, this time of heightened sensitivity and vulnerability gave me a fresh way of seeing things. Things that at that stage of their near disintegration would normally be dismissed as mere detritus, lying in gutters, behind plant pots, and rather a nuisance. But in these leaves, I've found an extraordinary beauty, individuality, and grace. I took these leaves up and gave them an attention so that they were seen in their own right, like a final act. I hope that you've enjoyed giving them your attention too. Thank you very much. Thank you, Norman. I think everyone would agree that your photographs are absolutely stunning.
So yeah. we're now going to move on to paper two of session two, and that will be given by Sandy Wood. So Sandy Wood is collections curator at the Royal Scottish Academy of Arts and Architecture. It's Scotland's oldest surviving artist run institution. Having entered the profession from a fine arts degree at Grey School of Arts in Aberdeen, Sandy has a particular interest in how curatorial and artistic practice can operate together in the gallery context and how the historic and contemporary can be engaged in dialogue. Over the last 10 years, Sandy has helped actively develop the RSA's collections while publishing on related subjects. He has curated numerous exhibitions including the major 2017 exhibition, Ages of Wonder, Scotland's Art, 1540 to now. So over to you, Sandy. Thank you, Shona. I'm just gonna see if I can get my screen shared. Okay. Thank you, Shona. Hello, everyone. I hope you enjoy my talk today, originally titled The Royal Scottish Academy to Infinity and Beyond, now renamed due to an impending Disney lawsuit. On the afternoon of Sunday 15th March, the staff and members of the RSA downed tools, leaving around 500 artworks in limbo before they could be selected and hung for the 194th RSA annual exhibition. For the first time since the first exhibition in 1827, it looked like it might not be possible for our annual celebration of art and architecture to go ahead. But for a show that survived uninterrupted through both world wars, we knew we couldn't give up that easily. How could we present over 400 works to our audiences when they couldn't access the galleries? The obvious solution was digital, but could we open an online exhibition on Friday 27th March the original date of the private view? Not quite, but opening the 2020 annual exhibition online on the 10th of April, less than a month after disaster struck, was still an achievement. Presented on a dedicated website built by ArtLogic and populated by our gallery manager, Flora Lathang, and the RSA team, the exhibition can be experienced using three main viewing options, a viewing room, which assembles the work in the way it might be experienced in an eclectic annual exhibition hang, a view by artist option, which does what mm -hmm. it says in the tin, and a browse tool, which enables discovery through media, budget, featured artist, theme, and category. Of course, viewing artworks digitally is not a complete replacement for the real thing. However, a neat feature of the site is the ability to view on a wall. With a white wall and a chair for contact, context, one can, for example, appreciate the difference between Ross Sinclair's monumental The Real Life Declaration of Arbroath 1320 to 2720 and Helen Wilson's satirical wee weaponry etching The Ubiquitous Chib. All works can also be hover zoomed, which allows appreciation of fine detail. In browsing by category, one can experience the group of artists invited by this year's exhibition convener, Graham Todd around a common call, to an idea of indoor space, a room, sharing ideas around presence, occupancy, the intimate, the handmade, the provisional, the everyday. Predicated by Graham on a response to the scale of the galleries to form a gradient between the cavernous and a more intimate kind of space, the assembled works took on a different identity as audiences viewed them while locked down in their own personal spaces. Our 194th annual exhibition will be remembered as an historical first for many reasons. Recognised as an astonishing achievement by Duncan Macmillan in his Scotsman Review, it also received plaudits from audiences and across the gallery sector as one of the first examples of taking a major exhibition online. Such was this attention that following an exploratory call with our president Joyce Cairns, the Royal Academy in England recently launched the curator selection of its 2020 summer exhibition, now in the winter, using ArtLogic's viewing rooms. You can still view our landmark 2020 exhibition online at rsaannualexhibition.org, so please go experience it for yourself. It also has Norman's work in it, which you have just seen in the, uh, the previous talk. It's worth leaving this first part of my presentation with the closing statement from Graham Todd's convener's essay. A journey of an exhibition that started with a letter lying on a patterned rug in a hallway has become a virtual screen experience 
art in extreme circumstances finds a way to emerge and to continue. And as we find ways to show the annual work without physically gathering together, we can still share the experience in other ways. Our spirits are still uplifted and we can still be inspired and have conversations. Art plays an essential part in our journey in these difficult times. The importance of art in these times as a reflection of culture and society and a tonic for the mind cannot be overstated. The survival of a healthy art scene is paramount for the survival of Scottish and wider British culture. Its survival now is precarious, however, even with the rescue pack packages being distributed. The practice and lives of many artists are in real peril as their means of income have evaporated. As an institution that supports Scottish artists, the Academy continues to provide a platform for exhibitions and administers awards for artists to make new work. It's done so since its foundation in 1826. It's always wonderful when we receive support to provide a new award to artists, but mm. it is more critical in times of hardship like these. And so being able to offer £30,000 to 12 artists through pandemic, a personal response to COVID-19, felt like an important moment. The original award of £20,000 for eight artists was increased by the funder on seeing the quality of the proposals. And you might see a familiar name in there from one of the, the talks in session one. Without wishing to give away the artist's ideas, they create a diverse picture of the personal, social and cultural impact of the pandemic. The exhibition is scheduled for next January, and we hope that restrictions don't prevent the airing of this unique event. Entwined with the Academy's support for artists and architects are our nationally significant collections, which were awarded recognised status in 2008. Mm. Containing nearly 8,000 individual artworks, they tell the story of Scottish art and artists over the last near 200 years and are regularly researched and exhibited. As projects such as Ages of Wonder, collection building awards like the John Kinross Ross Scholarship and collecting featured aspects such as recent exhibitions on Philip Reeves, David Meakey and William Littlejohn show, it is an organic part of the artistic whole that the Academy represents. Our collections team had to down tools at the same moment in March and our ability to make these stories accessible was impacted as a result. All exhibitions involving collections were postponed and all research access was halted. Fortunately, this is when the digitization strategies you have been working on come into their own. The potential to scan key academy archives, such as our annual reports, exhibitor listings and exhibition catalogues had been scoped late in 2019 and some quick organising meant the annual reports and exhibitor listings could be sent off for scanning before lockdown fully hit. The catalogues are in the process of being scanned as I speak, and you can see one of the early designs on screen just now. The digitisation improved research access for staff and meant the lack of physical access hit less hard. We were also able to draw on a project of digitisation begun in 2012 and progressed since, to create a unique means of access to our collections. The new RSA bookshelf feature on our website launched in July and provides page turning access to an initial selection from our sketchbook and library collections. Another batch of books is being prepared and we're looking forward to growing this resource in the months and years to come. It will also be key to making the aforementioned catalogues accessible and searchable in an online format. The pandemic has necessitated a shift to digital for museums and galleries. And although it can't be said to be a positive scenario, it has led to more in-house research and digi digital engagement with the RSA collections as physical activity has been sidelined. A renewed presence on social media with key support from our amazing volunteer, Nicola Brooks, and regular research blogs from our team and honorary art historian members, Murdo MacDonald, Tom Normand and Joanna Soden, I've seen the Academy make more of its collections and history accessible online than before. So what does the future hold? An institution's website is one of its most important tools in our current semi-digital existence, and that rings truer than ever now. During lockdown, we were able to publish a first group of near 100 of our past members on our website. And this is a project that will be progressed by student interns from St Andrews and Edinburgh universities over the coming months. The RSA website, although a real improvement on its previous incarnation, has been scrutinised over the lockdown period. Its importance to the continued business and indeed survival of the RSA is more important than ever. And we are exploring a full redesign of the site so it can serve our diverse needs going forward. 
The annual exhibition website was a real success, but it was frustrating that we could not realize it within our main site. This shortcoming and the desire to establish a fully accessible online collections database are driving our wider online strategic activity in the coming months. In the art world, academies are sometimes accused of being bastions of tradition, which lag behind the avant-garde. Building on a recent decade of change at the RSA, the pandemic has shown that now, quick adaptation and change are part and parcel of academy life in the 21st century. At the beginning of the year, no one would have believed our established artist members would be conducting all meetings on Zoom. Evolve to survive is the mantra, and although it feels like there is a long way to go, during the lockdown, the Academy has launched new initiatives, including exhibitions, awards, research projects, studio visits, and online features such as the RSA Bookshelf. Although we hope that access to our physical sites will return to something resembling normality soon, we are continuing to explore the ways that our website and other digital platforms can support, engage, and excite artists and audiences in Scotland and internationally. The present might be a bit scary, but as we look towards our bicentenary in 2026, the future will be anything but boring. Thank you. Thank you, Sandy. Uh, that, that's really interesting. And you've achieved, you've achieved so much um, during lockdown. So we're now going to move on to the last paper of this session. And that last paper is uh, presented by someone hopefully you're familiar with by now, and uh, that's Alice Strang. Alice is the uh, Senior Curator of Modern and Contemporary Art at the National Galleries of Scotland. Highlights of her career include the Scottish Colourist series of exhibitions of the work of FCB Caddell, JD Ferguson and JL Hunter. She is a BBC expert woman and was made a Saltire Society Outstanding Woman of Scotland for her leadership of the 2015 Modern Scottish Women Painters and Sculptors 1885 to 1965 project, including exhibition and publication. Following the COVID-19 lockdown, Alice was on furlough leave for six months, during which time she moved her curatorial practice online to Twitter, Instagram and her own website. So I'm going to pass over to you now, Alice. Thank you. Um, can everybody see my um, screen okay? Whoops. Not yet, have you shared it? Um, oh, hang on. That's it now, coming on, Alice. Okay, are we all, all set to go? Yep. Great, thank you. Uh, hello, everybody, again. So, um, check my time. Uh, between the 23rd of April and the 5th of July 2020, I made 164 posts on Instagram from the day after I was put on furlough leave from my job as senior curator at the National Galleries of Scotland until the day after museums and galleries were allowed to reopen. The curatorial approach was upbeat and politically neutral. The majority of works featured were from UK public collections by modern British artists uh, with an emphasis on Scottish and women artists and a focus on the interwar period. Uh, the intention was to demonstrate the power of art to help us understand our lives and surroundings during a time of unprecedented communal change. And the hope was to entertain, inspire, comfort, and to encourage learning at a time when the works of art themselves could not be seen in the flesh. Um, oh, now I don't know how to move between my slides. Oh, there we go. Sorry, first webinar, everyone. Um, most of my posts fell into three themes. The first responded to the COVID-19 lockdown as it unfolded, such as working from home, homeschooling, and the original recommendation to wear a face covering. Amongst the works which I chose to illustrate these topics were the ones that you can see on the slide. Um, so on the left, we have William Oliphant Hutchison's The Kitchen Bathroom of 1932 in Glasgow Life's collection with 87 lights. 
Uh, in the middle, we have John Melville's Natural History Museum of the Child of 1937 in Leeds Art Gallery with 73 likes. And on the right, Anna Zinkeisen's da The Dark Lady of 1938 in Nottingham Castle's Holdings, which got 135 likes. Um, broader current affairs were also addressed, uh, including VE Day, uh, Black Lives uh, Matter protests, and the summer solstice. Uh, for these, I chose on the left, um, Adrian Paul Allison's uh, The AFS Dig for Victory in St. James's Square of 1942, in the City of Westminster collection with 87 likes. Uh, in the middle, William Strang's Dreams of 1914, which belongs to Edinburgh Museums and Galleries, 112 likes. And I'll save you the question, he is sadly no relation. I married into the Strang Undertakers of Perth. Um, and on the right, Thomas Martin Ronaldson, Ronaldson's Summer of 1928 in Manchester Art Gallery, which got 126 likes. Um, a third strand of posts was intended to provide respite from these events, um, usually with a serene or humorous work or uh, joining in the vogue for recreating paintings in real life, as we saw in Margaret's uh, talk earlier. Um, examples included here on the left, we've got Dodd Proctor's The Hall Table in Townley Hall Art Gallery and Museum with 90 likes. Um, joking about lockdown hair in the middle, uh, whilst hairdressers remained closed with Evan Walter's portrait of a young woman of about 1929 in the Glyn Vivian Gallery with 114 likes. And on the right, uh, persuading my older son to pose as William Bruce Ellis Rankin's The Amateur Box, uh, sorry, The Amateur Boxer in Salford Museum with 160 likes. And I like to feel that I'd managed to combine a bit of homeschooling and a good old art history lesson all in one. Oh, wrong way. Completely wrong way. There we go. Um, The challenge for me as a curator was to translate the analog curatorial skills involved in putting together a physical exhibition into creating single posts in the digital sphere. I would scan the BBC UK website, um, the news website, to identify the daily issue to be addressed. On the 28th of May 2020, it was the final clap for NHS and other carers. I then found an appropriate work with which to address this uh, using what else but the marvelous Art UK website, which Terry told us about earlier. And in this instance, I decided upon Eric Robertson's Wynne Walker, the artist's wife of about 1924 in the Museum of Liverpool, which garnered 113 likes. Instagram is better for visual communication than Twitter which tends to awkwardly crop images and has a lower text limit. However, Instagram favors a square format, so elongated works were simply not effective. The speed of consumption on social media platforms is very fast um, as people scroll through multiple posts. I realized that bright images with a graphic composition, realist style, an aspect of nostalgia and an obvious connection to a shared topical experience were the most popular. popular. Abstraction was absolutely out. The next step was to pitch the interpretation of my posts. Uh, used to the limited word count suitable for a wall label, I soon devised a framework, which you can see in this slide, um, based on introducing that day's topic, followed by basic information about the artist, work and the collection to which it belongs and copyright details were relevant. Then there was the whole new world of hashtags and my most used ones included uh, modern Scottish art, Scottish women artist and digital curator. The timing of my posts was important to their reception, uh, something you don't have to consider with an exhibition open daily 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. I posted at about 7 a.m. as dictated by domestic responsibilities. Um, this used to be one of the busiest times of the day for social media traffic, 
uh, but this has steadily become later since lockdown um, to about 10 a.m., uh, perhaps due to changing work and commuting habits. Uh, working as a digital curator freed me from the practical, financial, bureaucratic considerations of real exhibitions. But at times, what I was doing felt perhaps a bit fleeting and superficial. Um, I began to learn the difference between real and digital engagement and key performance indicators, KPIs. Um, the connection with your social media followers um, is direct and intimate, uh, allowing for instant rapport and informality, and this was particularly welcome during the isolation of lockdown, and a contrast to being at one remove from gallery visitors. Uh, Practising artists, art, uh, relatives of the artists whose works I was posting, uh, the digital officers of the collections the works belong to, as well as general art lovers, uh, began to comment on my posts. Um, the fashion designer, Abby Nickel, you'll see here, she's on Instagram as Blue Cat Tweeds, um, began to explain the fabric and styles of the outwars, uh, outfits worn by the cities in uh, portraits, which I posted, which was wonderful. And the posts turned out to have the most incredible reach. Um, with followers from Scotland to Australia. Um, indeed, um, so instead of visitor numbers and ticket sales, um, success was based on the number of likes, comments, regrams, and adding them to other people's stories um, on, on Instagram. Uh, by far, uh, my most popular post was this one, <laughs> a recreation of William Strang's Lady with a Red Hat. I think the boys and I were particularly proud of that hat, of 1918 in Glasgow Life's collection with um, 244 likes and 30 comments. Uh, I made the uh, final post um, in this series on the 5th of July, 2020, uh, the morning after museums, galleries and pubs were allowed to reopen. I chose the work on the left, Ernest Proctor's 5am of 1928 in the Jerwood collection, which garnered 84 likes. Uh, having posted on the right, Harry Rutherford's The Custodian of 1947 in Thameside Council's collection the day before with 123 likes. I hope my efforts on Instagram encourage people to visit galleries and museums to, to see the works featured for real, as well as to appreciate the richness of UK public collections, which is what Art UK is um, all about. I think a positive legacy of the pandemic will be the increased presence and enjoyment of art in digital form. However, this raises questions such as, are audiences enlarged beyond those who can visit a venue but limited to those with the devices and IT skills involved. How does experiencing a work of art in real life compare to that of seeing it on screen? Will art lovers become accustomed to free digital consumption and become less willing to pay admission charges to exhibitions? The COVID-19 crisis has continued apace since the 5th of July, 2020, and we face an uncertain winter. I have since returned to work from Folo Leave and intend to maintain a digital strand within my curatorial practice. The role of art during lockdown, by necessity in digital form, in helping to come to terms with a new reality and to boost morale is obvious and vital. Going forward, I believe the importance of art for society is clearer and greater than ever, whether experienced upon walking into a gallery or whilst navigating a screen. The potential for developing a combination of both makes me excited for the future. Thank you. Thanks, Alice. That, that's great and really interesting to hear about. So we're now going to start the question and answer. Um, so hopefully all the panellists are visible. Before we start, I'd like you to introduce you to two of the panelists. So we have Isabella Wagner and Bianca Caligaro. So Isabella is a student at the University of Glasgow in her final year studying history of art and English literature. 
She is a volunteer tour guide with the MUSE programme, so that's Museum Students ed Educators at the Hunterian Art Gallery. This year, she was awarded MUSE of the Year for the contributions she made to the programme. She also undertook a work placement with the Hunterians Outreach Project as part of its 2020 cohort and participated in initiatives to move both of those projects online during the lockdown. Bianca mm -hmm. is the co-founder, editor and manager of Artgate Blog. She is currently studying history of art with film and television studies at the University of Glasgow and aims to pursue further study in the field of art curation. In addition to focusing on her studies, she's a columnist for Glasgow University magazine and volunteers as a museum guide at the Hunterian Art Gallery. She's currently working as a gallery intern at Six Foot Gallery in Glasgow. So hello to all the presenters. I'm gonna start with a question we've received for Norman from Jill. So Norman, what do you think the different media of analog and digital photography brings to your photographic work? I think there are two, two main things really there. One is about time. The feedback with digital is so much quicker. Um, so I can experiment more and I can, in a way, develop my work uh, in a deeper way and a deeper way as well as doing it more quickly. Um, so that's invaluable to me. I've spent uh, 30 years uh, under red light with film and it's wonderful. I, I still love what I think of as proper uh, photographic print, but um, things have moved on and I'm in a different stage. It's really wonderful to have the challenges of digital. And the big thing is that digital is now at a quality that is uh, worth having. It took a long time to reach there and uh, I think it's just uh, uh, wonderful. So there's that, but it also brings great advantages in the way that I can print in the digital sense. It's much more sophisticated. Um, the papers are now of a really high standard. Uh, the inks are archival are quality. The printer itself is fantastic quality. So I can, I can develop my printing skills as well, which have transferred directly from my time in the darkroom. Great, thank you, Norman. And the next question is for both Sandy and Alice. Have you noticed a change in who your audience members are with the switch to mainly digital engagement? If so, will this change how you choose to, to promote your collections in the future? Sandy, would you like to go first? Yeah, sure. It's an interesting question, I think, because you know, I think looking at the analytics from the annual exhibition website, which we've we've recently brought in. We didn't used to have Google Analytics on our site, so we couldn't really delve down into where people were visiting from. But I think that that demographic is probably fairly similar. There's mostly UK, a decent portion of Americans, but I think it's actually oddly because of where we are situated in Edinburgh in this tourist centre, it's actually gone down with Asian visitors who we would have had a lot of a lot of tourists, and that there's far fewer of that. I think what what you can't really tell is what type of visitor is, is coming. You don't, it doesn't dial down into more specifics. I think one of the interesting um, comments that I saw in the, in the, the chat at the side was that um, a mobility impaired visitor found the online showing of exhibitions invaluable and that it, it really opens up that access to a lot of people who can or couldn't make it out to the physical um, gallery space. And I think, therefore, you know, going forward, it's really important to have those different types of different kinds of access available. That means that you can have as wide an audience as you possibly can, um, because, you know, there are restrictions for people getting into town. And especially if access is going to be restricted going forward, we need to try and make everything or as much as possible available for everyone. Thank you, Sandy. And Alice? Um, well, I don't know that I really had an audience to start with because I used to use Twitter and Instagram really to promote what I was doing for, for my job. But then a term of furlough leave was that you weren't allowed to do anything that would benefit your employer. So that meant that I couldn't refer to uh, any work in the National Gallery's uh, collection or, you know, anything. 
um, which was quite a challenge because that's kind of all I'd done up to that point. Um, but it made me, you know, see beyond the National Gallery's amazing collection and I learned loads as a result. And, um, mm -hmm. um, and I, I, um, I loved the interaction with my, with my followers. Um, and I, I, as I say, I hope to, I hope to keep it up. Great, thank you, Alice. Um, I'm afraid we're a little bit short of time and I can see there's quite a few questions coming through for Alice. And so if it's all right with Alice, hopefully she can try and answer those in the next session. So I'm gonna move on to a question for Isabella. Isabella, how difficult was it to convert materials intended for face-to-face -face object engagement into an online resource? It was quite challenging. Um... You know, as I mentioned in my slideshow, a lot of the objects that we were using were three dimensional objects. And so the kind of activities that we developed around them were focusing on kind of looking at them, even touching them. And um, the kids would be able to kind of touch the objects and, um, you know, make kind of judgments based on that also. But it was also kind of challenging in, within the outreach project because um, basically it wouldn't be us kind of doing the teaching. We were kind of giving the resources to teachers so they kind of had to make of what they wanted with our resources. Um, but it was really great. I mean, our feedback was really illuminating as well, kind of what worked and what didn't. Um, obviously, the 2D objects kind of work better um, and quizzes kind of work better as well in that way. So, yeah, that was really interesting to see. Great. Thanks so much. And the last question we're going to take now is for Bianca. So, Bianca, were you already planning to create a blog or was this an impact of the pandemic and has this experience changed your career plans at all? So I would say this idea had been in the back of my mind for a while but then lockdown gave me a lot of time to to work on it uh, together with my with the co-founders and I think it was uh, really helpful and like really uh, positive in such difficult time to engage with something uh, productive and I guess uh, it really uh, shaped my perspective on my future career as I think it gave me like some new additional skills of working in a digital cultural world which I think are really uh, prominent and uh, needed right now so I would say yeah yes definitely great thank you very much and I'm afraid that's all we've got time for right now so I would like to say a huge thanks to all our, our presenters um, during this session. So what's going to happen now? Are we going to move into a coffee break and you'll see a presentation by Martin Disley, who is an artist and technology researcher. His presentation is called Cartographic Hallucination, Generative AI and the National Library of Scotland Map Collection. And you can just see we're uh, sharing the poll results just there. After Martin's presentation, there'll be a couple of information slides and music. Uh, the last slide will show you the running order for the final session and we'll run our final poll as well. So I'd just like to say thank you ever so much again uh, to all the presenters and we will see you after the break. Thank you.
Hi there, everyone, and welcome to the third and final session of the Lockdown Legacy event. And just a little reminder, the webinar is being recorded, and we'll send a link out to everyone um, after the event is finished. And um, we'd love to hear your questions for the speakers, which can be submitted at, um, during, throughout the session um, using the question and answer function. And um, so that takes us to the first speaker of the session, um, who is Nicola Osborne. Nicola is Programme Manager for Creative Informatics, leading delivery of this project, which brings together Edinburgh's creative, cultural and tech sectors create groundbreaking new products, services and experiences, which has continued to provide essential support and funding throughout lockdown. Since 2014, Nicola has been co-investigator of the Managing Your Digital Footprint, Footprint Research and co-tutor of the Digital Footprint course. Nicola is a member of the Turing Institute of Humanities and Data Science Interest Group, the Journal of Open Research Software Editorial Advisory Board and the Association of Internet Researchers. Today, she will talk to us about collaborating through the crisis, and art tech partnerships emerging from lockdown. And I'd like to hand over to Nicola. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to share my screen so you can see my slides. And close some windows so you can't see that. So. All right, so I'm going to talk about some projects we've been taking uh, to come on board with uh, during the lockdown. And I'm going to just sort of start by saying a little bit about the programme very quickly, just so you know who we are and what we do. Um, so uh, what is creative informatics? We support the creative industries in and around Edinburgh to become data driven. So that's through supporting the creation of new uh, products, services and experiences that are creative, but also about data or using data in new ways. And I think we've heard some fantastic presentations today that really help highlight how once you've got your uh, your creative and artistic content in a digitized form or you have a digital platform available to share that work you can do really interesting things so we're really looking at that kind of join up um, so it's been fantastic to the presentations today um, we have three funders um, and they include the Arts and Mighties Research Council and we're funded as part of a program that's funded by the UK Industrial Strategy so a lot of what we do is work with industry but also we're trying to bridge relationships between industry academia um, and cultural and creative organizations so if at the end of this talk you want to get in touch with us about anything, just drop a question in the chat and I'll, I'll get back to you because um, we'd love to work with more, more folks in the cultural community as well. Uh, we're from our Scottish Funding Council and also the Data Driven Innovation Programme to create the City Region Deal uh, for Edinburgh and South East Scotland as well. And one of nine clusters across the UK, so there's lots of interesting digital creative work taking place across all of those clusters. Um, do have a look if you're curious. And as I said in that slide, there was a joint partnership between Edinburgh and AP University, Edinburgh University, Creative Edinburgh and Codebase. So a really interesting mix of industry and creative people um, and universities. But what have we been doing during lockdown? What does it mean to be this project during lockdown? Before lockdown, we were running lots and lots of events, lots of funding calls. And when we started working from home on, I think, St. Patrick's Day, um, we needed to work out what we were going to do during lockdown. So we carried on supporting our community and doing a lot more of that because we were supporting uh, through various different funding strands, lots of startups, uh, lots of entrepreneurs to do projects and a lot of those people were very isolated during during lockdown so it was really important to kind of keep that support going and to keep our funding moving other people have talked already about the importance of getting funding back out to the creative industries and to creative people and so that was really important for us we moved all of our events online so that we could actually um, continue to serve people but we couldn't do them in quite the way we'd done before so I'll come back to that in a second um, and we also took on some new work because we found we were getting approaches from people who hadn't done as much digital work before were trying to do something different from the digital work they tried out before and thought we might be good partners for that so I'm going to talk about three of those just very briefly so the first thing I'm going to talk about is Friday Forums which were a partnership with Visual Arts Scotland uh, the second we talk about is some work we've done with Fruit Market Gallery and the third project I'm going to talk about is with Talbot Rice Gallery and my cat is going to try and come into shot. Just ignore him, I'm going to do that. Um, so Friday Forum uh, came about when Visual Arts Scotland was setting up their Emergency Art Workers Support Fund, which was uh, funding to help artists through the crisis. So like small, very quick, very easy to access grants. Um, they're doing something similar on a bigger scale at the moment with Creative Scotland actually. Um, so they approached us and asked how we could support them and because of the way our project's funded it's got quite specific things that we can do and specific things we can't do but we had a bit of wiggle room and some opportunities to do something slightly different so rather than give them uh, a small amount of money to go into that fund which was harder for us to do um, we kind of looked for a different way to collaborate that would allow us to get some money out to artists but also do something do something different add some value and we came together to kind of form this 
a 12 event series of events uh, called Friday Forums. They ran uh, via Zoom from April to July 2020. Um, Cam, who's our fantastic Zoom director today, uh, her skills are forged in these 12 learning things very, very quickly um, events. It was quite a, a very speedy way to get up to speed with the technology and to also um, to think about what makes a good online event because they look different from a good in-person event. So what we did was we suspended our, our labs, which are a monthly event we run throughout this period. And instead we focus on weekly events um, with Visual Arts Scotland. That meant there were 49 paid speaking opportunities, but also opportunities to promote the work of the artists, not just pay them some money to keep them going, but also help other people find them and find their work and look for collaboration opportunities. Um, it was a really lovely community that built up around it with a lot of repeat people coming in to sort of view the sessions or speakers from one week coming into the next week. Um, we had about 500 people register to come along to these sessions about 343, I believe, um, attended in total. Um, and we're still kind of evaluating what the speakers took away from it because a lot of the speakers don't usually do 10 minute online presentations about their work. And they often don't do um, sort of presentations about how they come to make their work in that kind of a way. Um, so we know that there were some, some skills benefits and some understanding the technology benefits they got out of it. So we're doing a bit of additional work to understand the positive impacts of that. And it was a huge learning process for Creative Informatics and for Visual Arts Scotland um, in really different ways and a really lovely new collaboration form. So we're looking at what we can do sort of next to them. Um, so we just got a screenshot there from one of our sessions, uh, which includes uh, Gria Pester, who's a visual artist, uh, poet and illustrator Iona Lee, performance artist Sweatstops, and sound artist Kim Moore, and then myself and Sarah Kalmus, who were chairing that particular week's event. Um, they were really fun, really interactive uh, experiences, and it got us to reach out to kind of artists and creatives of a totally new set, because we'd had a really good relationship building up with people throughout the creative industries uh, since our project started a couple of years ago. But um, this was a whole different audience who hadn't quite found us, and maybe were a bit more nervous about their relationship with tech. Um, so it was really nice to be able to reach out to them and build connections. The next project I want to talk about is with Fruit Market Gallery. So Fruit Market, you may well be aware of, um, commissioned Janet Cardiff and George Beers Miller to create Night Walk for Edinburgh, uh, which was shown at the Fringe. I think it was only last year. It feels like that was many years ago because it's been a very long year. Um, and which is this lovely, interactive, augmented reality walk around the city. And they were really keen to do something that would be accessible in a COVID safe socially distant way. But the way it had run before required quite a lot of people on the ground, lots of devices that would be difficult to kind of clean quickly. Um, and also it had enough people walking through it so that there was the issue of potentially not having people be socially distanced. But if you put it on someone's own device, their own phone, their own tablet, there are a couple of issues to overcome. Um, so although it's a kind of essentially just a video performance, you can't just let people download a video of something that is a piece of original artistic work uh, with the risk that that might get shared onwards and that their rights aren't necessarily protected. You don't want to have lots of people showing up at the same time and coming in groups of, sort of 20 or 30 so that even if you've tried to make it safe, uh, they, they make it unsafe by gathering together and it's obviously quite tempting to do. Um, and the video resolution is really important to the experience you have, so they want to have some control over that. Um, so we were able to work with uh, some wonderful colleagues of ours in design informatics, so a research software engineer um, and also one of our graduate students to build um, an app uh, available on iOS and Android um, and sort of built in one system to deploy to those two spaces. Um, and it was designed to be part of a structured scheduled set of events. So the Edinburgh International Festival, uh, this night walk was supposed to be part of, and we wanted to kind of set it up so that there were specific event right events as they'd done in the previous run. Uh, but that booking reference helped to validate the visitors and the visitor groups to help make it a COVID safe experience. So what those event right booking references do um, it, within the app, they help uh, then facilitate secure video download. Um, they allow us to validate the date and time that people went in, you know, are supposed to be going in and doing this walk. Um, they help validate the location that they're in. So you're not going to get to view your video even if you've downloaded it until you're in the right spot. Um, it's not super, super specific, but you need to be in Edinburgh, not in a random location, unless there's an accessibility reason, in which case there's a different workaround. Ask me in the chat if you want to know. Um, um, and it automatically deletes the file after the experience. So you have a certain amount of, uh, sort of hours, essentially, to take up your book slot, and then it will delete the video from your device so that there's no risk there in terms of the artist's copyright. And although it's quite a simple thing, uh, in theory, to, to get an app out that will deliver this kind of video content, 
in reality, addressing some of those challenges did require some real some real thought to work out kind of what what is the the most sensible, most straightforward way of making sure that people have a great experience, but it's also a safe experience and it's also appropriate to what the artists want from people to what they, what they want to take in terms of audio quality, video quality, and the sort of safety of their copyright. Um, so it was a really interesting project and you can try that out. They've extended the run. It was supposed to end at the end of October, but it's extended, I believe, and I think it will probably run again as well. Um, so do have a look at the Fruit Market website to find that and have a go. And then thirdly, the last project I want to talk about, and as I'm whizzing through three things very quickly, it's been a very busy year, um, is some work we've done with the Talbot Rice Gallery. So they too were trying to think about how to make a COVID safe experience for the visitor. And in April, there was a rapid response transform emergency now hackathon uh, with a partnership called Una 10, which is um, universities across Europe. So 10 different universities of which Edinburgh is the only UK one. And so Talbot Rice set a challenge for that event. And there was some initial work done with some fantastic uh, PhD and undergraduate students from Edinburgh, suggesting possible ways you could have people walk around the gallery when you can start to reopen, um, how you might sort of space that out, how the how you keep social distance in a space that's quite complicated. Because if you know the Talbot Rice Gallery, and I put a little map up here, I really won't see it in great detail, but you'll know there's lots of quite small spaces there and actually getting the flow right is really tricky. So during the summer, we worked with some, uh, some student interns and again, our research software engineer um, and our fantastic technician as well from Design Informatics um, to pilot a web app solution um, in order to track people as they go around the space. And again, very simple idea, but trying to get it to work in the right kind of way requires some really careful thinking about the design, testing things out, trying things out. There's lots of flow charts I almost put into the slides, but I thought they'd probably be too nerdy, but bear in mind there were some flow charts behind the scenes, so this quite simple uh, solution. Um, so we developed a pilot web app, we've demonstrated that and tested it with Talbot Rice Gallery. Um, and there's a fully working pilot now available. You can try it out, just get in touch with us. And we're planning to do some kind of self-service version and exactly what that might mean so that other galleries and small spaces can use it. So I'm just gonna play a very short little video that will allow you to see um, what it looks like. So here we have someone coming into Tuppet Rice Gallery. Uh, this was filmed after it was appropriate to have people in the physical space and under strict social distancing conditions. So you can see he's going up through this, what will be a kind of one-way system anyway within the space. They've got several staircases and several small spaces. And here he's getting across a traffic light saying, this is red, this space is too full, but someone who is uh, controlling this and invigilator in the space is able to open it up. Um, the reason we have a kind of manual override function here, you'll see how it works in a second, um, is to make sure that we can kind of control spaces as people walk around. Um, and we had lots of, uh, Tessa Goodwin from, from Talbot Rice uh, was amazing in setting the brief and telling us what was feasible and wasn't feasible. So he can see the guys walk through the gallery um, and our lovely demonstrator uh, is adding him to account. So it's a really manual plus or minus system, but it's really manual and connected to any other devices in the building. So any other room in the building that has an invigilator in it can also be tracking people. And that is, you know, that's collated in the same place. You don't have to have like a single log or whatever. They're all going into the same, system and the doors open or close accordingly and it's very simple but really effective um, so I'm going to stop screen sharing just now um, so those are the three things I wanted to show you really different things um, and all kind of trying to think about clever digital interventions that are as simple as possible to try and help make COVID safe experiences or help people um, engage with other kind of creative practitioners and things. So I hope those are really interesting. And I hope if you have any questions about the specific technical approaches we took, um, that you'll kind of raise those in the Q&A or in the chat. Um, and I think with that, I will pass on to the next speaker if that's okay. So back, back to Claire. Um, and yes, I will look at the questions. Thank you. Excellent, thank you, Nicola. Nice to meet your cat as well. Um, I think there's a few requests to, to see your cat um, in person. Um, so I'd like, like to move on to our next speaker, um, Alexandra Jones. Alex is currently working on a collaborative PhD with the University of St Andrews and National Museum Scotland. Um, her research focuses on collections from Ethiopia, exploring the biographies of these objects and their journeys into the museum collection. Her research follows on from four years spent working at the V&A Museum from 2015 to 2019, um, where she created a display of the museum's Ethiopian collection. Before joining the museum world, Alex spent seven years working as a software engineer before returning to university in 2014 to obtain an MSc in museum studies. Her unusual route into the sector has given her a particular interest in the intersection of art, heritage and technology. 
And I'd like to hand over to Alex, who will talk about automating access to collections during lockdown. Thank you, Claire. I'm just going to share my screen. Hopefully you can see my presentation now. Um, so as Claire said, um, I'm currently doing my PhD uh, with the University of St Andrews and National Museum of Scotland. Um, but before I joined the museum sector, I worked as a software engineer. So um, a lot of what I'm going to be talking about today kind of combines those, those two aspects of my, my career history. So my PhD focuses on the Ethiopian collections in the National Museums of Scotland and other museum collections across the UK. I started my PhD in January of this year, um, and I'm actually based in London, even though my both of my institutions for my PhD are up in Scotland. So I was able to fit in one trip to Scotland uh, to physically see the, the objects in the collection, which you can see here on this slide. Um, before lockdown hit and then the majority of my PhD has really been carried out uh, here in my my spare room um, as I'm sure that the many PhD students can identify with this um, so when it became apparent that I wasn't going to be able to physically go to any institutions or uh, see any objects or even speak to any curators because uh, so many people were on furlough something my supervisors and I agreed that I could be kind of getting on with would be this desktop survey of uh, some of the biggest institutions that we, we already knew had significant quantities of Ethiopian material so that I could get an idea of kind of what else is out there. So they suggested that I could look at the information these institutions had already made available on their websites, on their online collections databases, um, and I could start to kind of take stock of uh, what was out there that I could then use that information to compare the material in the National Museum of Scotland collection. So I started with the British Museum website um, and I did a very simple search, uh, just typed in the word Ethiopia as a keyword and I got nearly three and a half thousand search results. Um, and while there are a lot of Ethiopian objects in the British Museum collection, um, not all of the objects that return for the word Ethiopia would necessarily be relevant to me. So I was faced with this task of how do I narrow this down? How do I start to kind of work through this information um, and find the results that are relevant and the information I need um, without being able to speak to any any curators at the institution um, at which point I thought my kind of software engineer brain kicked in and I kind of thought maybe I can do something here maybe I can find a kind of a, a more automated way to do this so I decided to uh, to sort of dust off my old uh, software engineering coding skills um, and have a go at seeing what, what I could put together here. The approach I went for, um, a phrase you hear a lot in the, the software injury industry is kind of bang for buck. So I wanted to get the most out of what I was doing and um, without spending huge amounts of time on it because my PhD is about researching these collections, looking at these objects, it's not about writing code. So I didn't want to spend kind of months trying to come up with the most perfect software tool um, if I really could have actually just in that time done the work from scratch myself so I was trying to kind of really balance the time it was taking me and, and the work resources I was getting so you know this is not the most polished uh, perfect approach to writing code but um, trying to get something that would work for me personally and so what I uh, did I started with the source code for the website um, so if you're familiar with going to a website and you can click on your browser and you can look at the source code, which is kind of looks like gibberish, but this is the kind of raw text data that's there uh, telling the website what it's going to display to you on screen. So I had a look at the, the source code for one of the British Museum's uh, pages, search results that was returned. And I realized that a lot of the data I needed was in there. So I thought, okay, maybe I can write a tool that's going to look at that and try and pull the information out of there. And this is where I let you in on a a secret if you're not familiar with coding which is that 90 percent of the process of writing code is googling how to do something so um you know not uh, very little of this came kind of from the top of my head but you know I, I basically googled and said okay how do i get some code that pulls the text from uh, the website um and sure enough somebody had a little snippet of code here on, on github um which is a forum where people kind of share snippets of code like this and i was able to get what i needed to do there 
Um, and I'm not going to get super, super technical, um, but I think the thing I want to highlight here is that in terms of the tools I was using, um, when I was a software engineer, you know, we had massive amounts of uh, programs and, uh, and servers and sophisticated ways of doing this. And, and here I was just using a notepad on my laptop and something called Windows PowerShell, which is um, basically a, co a command line prompt and a scripting language where you can Right, uh, right. You, we can run very basic programs. Um, so it, this might look like complete nonsense, um, and I don't want to bog everyone down with kind of all the technical details. But just a very simple explanation of what this code is doing. It's looking for something called a regular expression, which is basically a pattern that I'm telling it to look for in the source code. So, for example, there it's saying find this line that has the word museum number in it, and then the little highlighted bit there, that number with AF, that's the museum number for this particular object. So that gives you an idea of how this script is going through the source code and pulling out the information I need. Uh, the information I was looking to pull from these websites um, was based, my PhD is very much based around how the objects were collected, when they were collected and who they were collected by. So this was the kind of information I was trying to obtain. And not all objects will have this information available, not all institutions will have all of these details for all of their objects, but where possible, this was the data I was trying to get for each object I was looking at. Um, and what I ended up with was an enormous Excel spreadsheet. Um, and I don't want to I don't want to give you the impression that I just kind of press run on my code and then got this spreadsheet you know there was a huge amount of still very manual work I was doing afterwards to kind of tidy up the results I got you know I was running running my scripts and then finding that the results didn't quite come back right or that they came back looking a bit weird or gibberish and so there was a lot of kind of back and forth and manual tweaking going on here but eventually um, I was able to get the results from uh, most of the institutions and I'll talk a bit more about what worked and what didn't um, into this format which then has been really really useful because once the data is in Excel um, Excel is not good for some things as we heard recently but it, what it is very good at is for kind of processing this kind of data um, and so I was able I now have this spreadsheet where I can start looking for I want all the objects that were collected in a particular year or I want all the objects that came from a particular donor and um, that kind of thing and that's been really really helpful to help me identify kind of these broad patterns of collecting Ethiopian material uh, in the UK and which I can then use to uh, situate and contextualise the research I'm doing into the uh, collections in Edinburgh. So some of the lessons that I learned through trying to do this, um, the first thing is that not all websites will cooperate with you when you're trying to do this sort of approach. So um, I found that luckily the British Museum website did did let me do this um, fairly fairly easily. You know, it was, that was the first institution I tried this on, and it did work, and so that saved me a huge amount of time. But other institutions, um, the process was a little bit more involved, or it took me a little bit longer. You know, the the results that the web pages returned didn't weren't quite as easy to kind of parse with these scripts. And I found that with the library that I tried to look at, so I tried to look at the manuscript collections of the British Library and the Bodleian Library, um, and with those, I found that um, I just couldn't make this work at all. And, and that doesn't mean that those websites aren't, aren't good. In fact, it probably means that they're a little bit more sophisticated um, in the way that they're returning these results. And it made it a bit harder for me to, uh, to run my scripts with them. And again, um, I, didn't, I, I didn't want to kind of get really bogged down with trying to make that work. Sometimes it was like, okay, well, this library only actually has about a hundred things. I can probably just look at those manually. So I was still combining kind of very uh, more kind of old fashioned ways of looking at these things and even looking at kind of paper records, um, but also where I could, I was trying to automate um, some of the research. As I've just said, yes, yeah, so lots of manual work involved. Um, and it's a really obvious point, but doing this depends on the information being there to begin with. So, you know, if the institution hasn't catalogued the information already, then I'm not going to be able to find it through doing this approach. So at some point I still do need to speak to the institutions um, and speak to the curators there when I'm able to and see kind of is there anything I might have missed? And I can't confirm that I did crash the British Museum website, but I will say that at uh, one point I was running my script for kind of the, I don't know, the umpteenth time that day trying to get it right. And suddenly I couldn't access the British Museum website anymore for about half a day. Um, and it did come back, but I got a little bit of a fright there. And that, that kind of reminded me that these websites aren't necessarily designed for you to be spamming them with, with hundreds of requests a day. So that's definitely something to keep in mind. 
Um, but overall, I would say that this was a success and it did enable me to get a huge amount of data um, in, in this way without having access to actually the institutions themselves and the curators there. Um, and I've now got a spreadsheet uh, which contains around 4,000 Ethiopian objects in UK collections that I can really use to contextualise the objects I'm looking at um, in Edinburgh. Um, so I think to sum up, I'd say that um, learning some coding skills, if you are a PhD student or a researcher, can be a really useful thing to do. Um, and in lockdown, it's been a really invaluable way for me to um, continue with my research. Thank you very much. I will stop my screen share now. Great, thank you, Alex. And I'm sure the audience will have lots of questions for you. Um, and I'd like to welcome our final speaker of the day, Rona Taylor. Um, Rona is a practicing visual artist based in Edinburgh and the current vice president of the Society of Scottish Artists. She's worked for a number of arts organisations, including Art UK, um, as a coordinator on their sculpture project, and Art360 Foundation as an associate archivist on the Art360 Scotland project. Before studying painting at Edinburgh College of Art, she worked as an arts journalist, writer and editor. Um, and since lockdown began, she's been one of the main people behind the SSA, SSA's um, online professional development programme. Today, she will talk to us about providing a digital toolkit for artists. And I'll now hand over to Rona. Thanks, Claire. I'm just going to share my screen. Hopefully everyone can see that. So yeah, thanks very much. Um, and thanks also to the Scottish Society for Art History and Creative Informatics. Um, for organising today and Alice as well. Um, and thanks everyone for sticking with us right to the end. Um, so the Society of Scottish Artists, if you don't know who we are, we're the biggest artist-led membership organisation in Scotland. Um, we've got around 1300 members and I've seen some of the names of some of our members on here today, so that's really nice. Uh, we were formed in 1891. We held our first annual show at the RSA and we still hold it there today. So um, as Claire said, I'm the vice president. Uh, we currently, for the first time, have got two co-presidents. So that's Olivia Turner and Jamie McAteer. Um, the three of us all started our posts uh, together this year and we kind of work uh, very closely together and that's really great fun. Uh, so we also have a council, you can see there, they're the ones at the bottom, obviously, um, and we have a great team of satellite associates who are based around Scotland. So that was something that we introduced this year um, to kind of improve our engagement outside the central belt. So uh, we're all volunteers, we have one part-time paid administrator, um, and we, we receive no um, external funding, we're just funded by our membership fees. So as you can see there, we've moved on a little bit since 1903. Um, we've been holding our council meetings on Zoom since the beginning of lockdown. Um, glad to say that our gender balance has improved a little bit as well. So we still hold our annual exhibition at the RSA. That's a really big event for us. It's a really big event for our members. Um, it's put together completely by our, our volunteer members. So put together, selected, curated, installed, we do the catalogue, it's, it's all done by us. And we don't just show our members work, uh, we show international artists and we also visit all the degree shows in Scotland and then we select graduates to show the following year. I don't recommend uh, that use of ladders, by the way, sorry about that. Um, we hold exhibitions at other venues as well around Scotland to try and uh, increase our reach outside the cities. And we want to provide a really varied and interesting exhibitions program just throughout the whole year. So um, we've been working with kind of public and commercial galleries to do that. In fact, we had a fantastic lineup of shows around Scotland planned for this year. Um, and those were from kind of the borders up to Ardna Merkin. Um, and we very reluctantly postponed um, or cancelled those. And unfortunately that did include our annual at the RSA. So that was a, a big disappointment for us. So to give you an idea how we used to select our work up until relatively recently, we selected work in person. So you can see that image on the left, that's from an article in the Scotsman in 1966. Um, and the image on the right uh, is mm, 2013, I think, at the RSA. So um, there's the chairs all set up for the committee who've gone for a cigarette or something. Um, so the work was actually brought to the gallery. So the selection committee not only could see it in person, but they could see it in person in the venue um, and next to the other work as well that was um, being selected. So in 2014, along with a lot of other arts organisations, the Society trialled a digital submission system 
Um, we now use something called OESS. That's, that was actually set up by an SSA member um, and it's used by organizations around the UK. So this is what selectors see. So this is actually um, from last year's annual submission. So this was Olivia's work. And you can see there the numbers on the left. So this was a joint exhibition with Visual Arts Scotland, um, but we had 2,100 submissions and that did not include any of the proposals for um, installations and it didn't include any moving image. So that's just 2D and 3D work. And we also see on there short statements about the work and things like dimensions and materials because you can't really tell that just from the image. So we had 10 people selecting, everyone looks on their own, on their own um, computers, and then we spent two days, all, the, all 10 of us together, um, discussing what we'd, what we'd all kind of voted for. So there are many advantages for us to doing it digitally, but as everyone on here I'm sure knows, you know, sometimes when you see an artwork you get this really emotional response or a very kind of visceral response to it. Um, and I, I think that's really, really hard when it's on a computer screen. So in addition to that, there's just so many entries that we get. So things have to be really good. Um, and actually not all of our submissions have photography like this. So, you know, there's a massive variety that we get and it's the same with the statements. Some are very clear, some really aren't. So, you know, we've known for a while that there are significant gaps in people's knowledge and that puts a lot of really good artists at a massive disadvantage. So we have a huge range of members from students um, right up to elected professional members and every member gets the opportunity to have uh, their own page on our website so and that in itself just highlights some of the challenges. Um, this is our current website it's something that we've been redoing during lockdown so we're going to have a new members website um, sorry a new members kind of section as well so the training that I'm going to talk about new members will be able to ac access it on there. Um, an artist's online presence is just, it's vital if they want certain opportunities. And it's just assumed that artists know how to do all this stuff. And, you know, a lot of them just really don't. So as I say, I know it's not ideal to view work on a screen, but that is the reality, um, especially with submissions. So we just want um, artists to be, basically to be able to present themselves and their practice as best they can within those limitations. So we put a lot of consideration into what we were gonna do this year. And we decided to plan an online professional development program to replace our annual show. So not just to teach digital skills, but also to use the digital platforms that people were becoming more comfortable using to teach other skills as well. So how to photograph your artwork, how to write about your practice, how to present it, archiving, how to get funding, how to get publicity and how to use social media. So we surveyed membership actually on what they wanted from us as well. So we had an idea of, of what people felt their own skills that were lacking. So we came up with this professional development program running through October and November. So we're right in the middle of it now. Um, and we approached a number of very lovely people, uh, partners and organizations with real expertise um, to ask them to collaborate with us on a series of workshops. So here's one that we did with Art UK's photography managers, uh, Jesse and Colin. They did a brilliant webinar on photography for us. And we also worked with other partners on eight events in total. So um, we had Moira Jeffrey, the writer and critic. She ran a session on writing. The Art360 Foundation, they're gonna be running a workshop on archiving later this month. And we also used our own skills and experience that, that we have ourselves. So um, Jamie, one of our presidents, he runs, uh, he owns a framing business and he's worked with some of the major galleries in Scotland. So he did a session on presenting your artwork. Olivia and I both have experience in publicity. So we're gonna be doing a workshop on that next week. So as part of that same program, um, we've also been running uh, events for members on how they might get more opportunities outside the SSA. So these are stills from two webinars that we actually just ran this past week. Um, so I'm working on galleries and working with residences. So the galleries that we worked with were Antoba on Mull, Travelling Gallery, Tatha Gallery in Newport-on-Tay and the Pier Art Centre in Orkney. And the residency centres that we worked with, Cove Park in Argyle, the Royal, Royal Drawing School at Dumfries House in East Ayrshire and Hospital Field in Arbroath. So we've been kind of using those digital platforms to engage with and build partnerships with this fantastic variety of organisations right around Scotland. So not just in the central belt. Um, and I think more importantly, to bring 
all of that to our members who are living all around Scotland because we've got a lot who don't live in the central belt so it's it's been great to be able to just engage them more than we've been able to do in the past so it's been a massive learning curve for us um, I'm pleased to report that we've had no major disasters that anyone has noticed um, and we've had some really great feedback from our members as well so um, we've kind of we've noticed that it's sort of built up in momentum um, and uh, one of our events this week, we had 150 people attending. So it's been really great and really engaging. Um, and those will be available for our members on the website. So alongside this, we've been looking at putting on exhibitions online. Now, up until now, we haven't had the technology to do that. So we had an exhibition that was just ready. It was ready to install just before lockdown, um, Urban Departures, which was going to be at House for an Art Lover in Glasgow uh, with five of our members. So we did decide to go ahead with an online exhibition for that. but We didn't have the facility to do it. So we did that with Art North Projects, who ran Project Room 2020 this year, which has been brilliant. Um, they're worth looking up actually if, if you don't know them so and we also did a virtual zoom opening with a series of talks from the five artists and that was open to everyone not just members and it was really great fun so we've also run a number of other events we started a series called ssa dialogues and that's something we plan to continue so that's just a kind of umbrella for in conversation events with um, people at the very start of lockdown on instagram we ran meet the members post to promote our artists and we then invited several members to give talks about their work and we did that as Zoom meetings. So that achieved two things for us. Firstly, it promoted our members, but also one of our uh, kind of aims as a society is to support our members. So we have been really aware that a lot of people have been very isolated this year and have been finding it very difficult. So as well as kind of promoting our artists, that just that brought some of our members together for a chat so they could kind of see some friendly faces. So I think that was really important as well. Um, and council members also held forums based around their practice. So again, those were public events. And we started a YouTube channel. We hadn't done that before. So all of our public events are up there. Um, so you can just give us a follow and um, have a look at those. So where do we go from here? Um, well, we've just subscribed to the same viewing room software that Sandy was talking about that the RSA already have. And um, so we're planning to use that alongside our physical exhibitions when hopefully those start again uh, in January. So we've got one planned at Tatha with our professional members. We'll be trialing the um, ArtLogic software uh, this month with a 30 by 30 exhibition. So that's small works, all under 250 quid. That's not selected or curated in any way. Any of our members can submit it. It's usually part of um, our annual exhibition at the RSA. And it's a very popular part. So that's going to kick off on November the 27th via our website. You can get all your Christmas presents while supporting artists in Scotland and our society as well. Uh, so you can follow all of our social media on there. Uh, for details and it will be linked to you from our website as well and if you've got any questions about society um, or anything that I've spoken about then you're very welcome to contact me there's my email address or our administrator Cheryl that's hers as well so thanks very much for listening Great, thank you, Laura. Um, this leads us into the question and answer session, session. So I'd like to welcome back the speakers from this session, Nicola, Alex and Rona. Um, and we're also joined by Martin Disley, who's an artist and technology researcher who provided the visual presentation during the break. Um, the current focus of Martin's work is machine vision technology. He's previously artist in residence at the National Library of Scotland and is currently working in a commission for Neon Festival. His work has been exhibited at the V&A in Dundee, Summer Hall in Edinburgh, Centre for Contemporary Arts in Glasgow um, and in Salingen, Germany and Barcelona also. Um, now that we're joined by all of our presenters, I think we can move on to the questions. So I'll just bring those up. Um, so our first question is from an anon anonymous attendee um, and it's directed to Alex. Uh, where can we start to learn code? Yes, so um, I think there's a few, there's a few different places to look. I mean, my information is a bit out of date because I, I learned kind of on the job um, quite a few years ago now. Um, but the main thing I would say is that um, it kind of doesn't matter what language you start with or um, what, you know, how, how you begin coding because so much of, once you know how to code in one language, it is really easy to transfer that knowledge over to other, um, you know, other types of coding. So um, I'd never used Windows PowerShell before I started doing these tools, but it, you know, with a, again, with quite a bit of Googling and just a bit of trial and error, you can usually figure out kind of once you've got the basic building blocks. So, um, so I would just kind of 
start somewhere like um, an online course that maybe there's something via FutureLearn or something like that or get a book kind of just coding for beginners and then just try it out and I think a lot of the time you just learn by find something online that someone else has done that sort of does what you want and then tweak it and, and see if you can adapt that um, to do what you want it to do and just have a go. Great, thank you. Um, and just looking at another question, we have um, one for Nicola, who are creative informatics going to work with next? So we have a lot, of, I didn't put in the details of everything we're doing at the moment because there's lots of different things going on. So um, Martin's actually one of our resident entrepreneurs. We have about 27 of those working at the moment. We have nine creative, connected innovators uh, doing some work, including several visual artists and things in there. Um, so there's lots of different projects of that ilk. In terms of collaborations with galleries, museums and things, um, it kind of depends on who approaches us and what kind of challenges they're facing. So we do have a call open at the moment for, um, for challenge projects. So we have uh, a kind of funding mechanism where cultural organisations can set us a challenge and then we will put that out. If we select it, it goes out to SMEs and entrepreneurs um, along with some money. So they can get up to 20K to do some R&D that will answer a real pain point or a challenge facing those cultural organisations. So there are a few of those that have just um, been out and had responses in, um, and there's a new call at the moment. So if anyone's interested in working us with some money attached, um, and they're in Edinburgh and South East Scotland, that's live at the moment. You can get to that from the Creative Informatics website. But for other kinds of approaches, if you want to have a look at the TRG Visitor Flow app, if you've got some other things that just don't fit into any of our normal structures, just get in touch because we're really open to collaborating and working with others and pointing people in the direction of really interesting people to work with as well. So, um, you know, try us. We'll <laughs> There's lots of people who are working with at the moment, but that, you know, it includes, um, yeah, at the moment, some of the live projects include things like Jupiter Artland um, and the John Byrne Award and things, but we also, we're open to lots of new collaborations. So just get in touch and, and just, we can work out where there's an appropriate fit. Thank you. Sounds very exciting and busy. Great to hear more about your, your work going on at the moment. Um, so this takes us to our final question of the day. Um, and this is for Rona. How can artists join the SSE? Uh, well, thanks for asking. I probably should have mentioned that. You can join via our website. Um, and I should just point out as well that it's not just artists. So we actually have, um, so we've got the four memberships that I showed you on that website. But we also have a membership um, for uh, anyone who's interested in the arts, so that might be art historians or curators. Um, so we do have that um, and we, you kind of get invited to all our events and things like that. So it'd be very lovely if anyone did want to join. Um, yeah, it's on our website. Excellent, thank you. Um, so I think that's all the questions that we have. Um, we'll just double check that we don't have any more. Yes, that's everything. Um, and just before we move on to the closing remarks, and um, we've had a request for all of the um, panel just to look at the camera and wave so that we can take a, a group shot of everyone. Would you all like to look and wave? Good. This isn't awkward at all. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. That's great. Thank you, everyone. Um, so I'm mindful of time, so I'll just say um, a few closing remarks. Um, I would just like to close the event by thanking everyone, um, all the speakers and presenters, for their papers and slides, which provided a really important insight into um, and record of the profound impact of coronavirus on the arts and heritage sectors. Um, I think this time last year, I'm, I'm sure that we probably all agree um, that it would have been unthinkable to find ourselves in this situation. And I think that um, the presentations today just demonstrate um, our resilience, our flexibility, but also our dedication um, to our sectors more generally. Um, our audiences, our institutions, our collections, um, all at the very, very forefront of our thoughts there. And um, thank you to also to all the audience members who have joined us today um, and contributed to our discussions throughout the morning. Um, I would like to say some special thanks to our Zoom director, Cam Chan, who's done an amazing work behind the scenes and um, making sure this all, all works. Um, and also Nicola Osborne um, from Creative Informatics too, um, for all of their, their hard work and, and dedication to the event. So thank you very much to you both. Um, from the Scottish Society for Art History, we'd also like to thank Alice Strang, Shona Elliott and Judith Liddell um, for all of their hard work in organising and promoting the event today. Um, and Shona kindly provided the musical interlude during the breaks there as well. Um, shortly after the event, um, we're going to circulate a survey to all of the attendees. Um, we're really, really interested to receive your feedback in the event, which will help us um, organise future events and make sure that these are as success successful as possible. Um, and we'll also share with you a link to a recording of the event as well, 
and um, which will be live for two weeks so you can um, watch the event at a time that, that is convenient for you too. Um, if you'd like to become a member of the Scottish Society for Art History, um, there are details of how to join on our website. Um, we're currently offering November, December 2023 if you sign up for, for membership in 2021. Um, we have another event coming up in, in February. Um, it's our annual study day based on art, landscape and space. Um, and tickets are already it's available by event, event right. If you'd like to sign up for the Creative Informatics ma mailing list and um, for regular updates on funding opportunities and events, um, you, can, you can find out more via Creative Informatics website. So I think that's everything. Um, I would just like to say again, thank you to everyone, all presenters and attendees um, for all of your input into the event today. Um, I really enjoyed it and I hope that you did too. And wish you um, a great weekend.